give you a couple of breaks. And I know it's going for uh, kind of lunchtime for a lot of us. So uh, we'll definitely be taking a couple of breaks and they will kind of at least get a bite to eat. Uh, the format of this is going to be kind of lecture and demo and the lecture and demo. We are covering a few more of the uh, complex topics, or I guess there's a little bit more to them in terms of setting some of this up. So some of the demos, uh, to make it go a bit smoother, I re-recorded or pre-recorded all the action and made kind of a video of them, right? So as we're kind of going through that, and then I'll just live narrate over it. That way we can, uh, we'll have kind of a smoother experience in case I make a mistake because I actually am going to follow along on some of our documentation during this just because there's a lot of steps and I don't want to make sure I miss something. So I can kind of speed that up. And I also can speed up the pauses where we sit here and hit enter and then have to wait for uh, status bars to complete, which can take a while, right? Uh, both in cloud environments. Ours usually isn't too bad, of course, right? Brag, brag. But um, uh, sometimes when you deploy something, obviously it takes a few minutes for, you know, the files to copy, to sync up, things like that to come online. And if we waited for all of that to get done live, uh, we'd probably be here a couple of days. So I pre-recorded some of the demos just so we can kind of speed that up and I can truncate a little bit. I am going to, like I said, live record over them. The other piece to this is there's no actual real labs associated with this under like the basic training, or unlike the basic training, but there is kind of a self-study piece, right? Uh, please deploy this and try it out, try all the features out. You've got the ability to activate a uh, free trial and some of you have NFR keys. Either way, you can um, create a test environment out and, and try all this out. Right? You'll have a copy of the recording and the slides. We've got some nice documentation online knowledge base articles. I'm going to link to all of that. So you'll be able to uh, see that and just kind of follow along and, and practice the steps out so you can kind of get that done. Additionally, uh, as I said, a recording of today's uh, session will be made available to you. So you'll have that. And a copy of the slides also will be available. So you'll have both of those things as well as just our normal regular documentation. And then there is a new um, advanced certification exam. So we would highly encourage our partners to please take it all kind of is to get you closer to, to doing that. It will be a little bit more difficult, of course, than the basic one, uh, but you should be able to kind of get through that um, doing that exam there. Okay, let's move on a little bit. The uh, prerequisites, this is advanced training, not basic training. So I am expecting a few things out of you uh, in terms of uh, an understanding of uh, functional experience with a remote application server. Hopefully you've completed the basic training and gotten certified on that. Uh, more importantly, though, also is you've got a little bit of hands on experience. You've installed it a few times. So when I start talking about, you know, how you do something plus in this to add, add a new server or add a new server component, I can do that. You're kind of understanding how we publish applications, filtering, and permissions, RAS policies, HTML5 interface, the clients, none of that should be a big surprise to you. Uh, I'll circle back to a few things and a few references here and there, but for the most part, I'm assuming that, you know, you've kind of already got that. Um, also, in addition to that, you'd have a working knowledge of the underlying RAS architecture. So if I start talking about publishing agents and gateways and how load balancers um, and so forth, remote desktop servers, VDI infrastructure, so forth, you're not completely in the dark. You kind of have an understanding of, of what I'm talking about there. So we are kind of expecting that you've got that. There is a, uh, a video online. It's part of the training. It's in the partner portal training, and it does go over the basic remote application server infrastructure. I believe it's also up on YouTube as well. If you just search on Parallels RAS YouTube, it'll take you to all our, uh, our YouTube videos online. But that'll give you that background that you need if you don't have it. And the other piece, uh, a lot of this does expect that you've got a working knowledge of Active Directory and at least some basic understanding of DNS and how that works, even if you're not a DNS administrator. I'm not going too deep into the weeds on either of those two topics, um, but you should kind of have an understanding of what I'm talking about when I hit some of that and what the documentation talks about so that you're not um, I'm just kind of completely lost. You can kind of follow along and say, oh, okay, yeah, I know what he's talking about. I know what he's talking about. Even if maybe you're a little rusty and don't know exactly the how to click, 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 do it like a daily admin would do, but you can at least follow on. So that's kind of what we're expecting for, uh, like I said, the basic skills in terms of um, the background from you guys. 
Additionally to that, uh, I always throw this up because I don't want people to forget that this isn't the only documentation and resources we have. If you go online to http colon forward slash forward slash parallel.com slash product slash rest slash support, it takes you to our online knowledge area. I never remember that. I go to parallels.com, that's easy to remember. And then I click on support up in kind of the red banner area. And then I choose the product, which is remote application server. And then that takes you to essentially that page. Other than logging in to contact our support organization, right there also has access to our knowledge base. You can also just go to kb.parallels.com to get to that and then uh, pick your product. Um, there's a lot of uh, articles that describe how to do things in the knowledge base. And I actually will pop a bunch of them up on the screen and reference them as they go through so you'll be able to see them and find them um, easily. Although if you search on it, you should be able to find it pretty easily as well. But we do have a lot of knowledge base articles on this and a lot of the topics I'm covering. And then from that page, if you scroll all the way down to the bottom, you'll get to our documentation. It's a little blue link. It's not very obvious, um, but it's there. It says technical, technical documentation and resources. And within that, or within that, you'll see the admin guide, uh, our solutions guide, our best practices guide, the client guides, reference architectures, printing best practices, kind of a licensing overview, a whole ton of stuff in there, case studies, all sorts of things like that. So that's definitely worth kind of looking at and going to when you're trying to uh, work how to do this. And a lot of how-to kind of step-by-step -step information is built into that. Okay, and with all that, this is kind of what we're gonna be covering in terms of the topics. We're going starting obviously with the introduction and overview. We're actually kind of a good chunk of the way through that already. But we're going to look at the certificate manager within RAS that's new, then we're going to get into multi-tenancy and the tenant broker. We're going to talk about using a cloud-based load balancer instead of our HALB, High Availability Load Balancer Virtual Appliance, uh, because once you're running in a cloud environment, you really don't want to use our load balancer. It's going to add a lot of cost and complexity to you, and we really don't like either of those. Um, so we want you to we highly recommend that you use the uh, the Azure and AWS load balancers or, or the load balancers from another platform, pretty much almost any load balance, even if you're on-prem. I had somebody uh, talk to me the other day and they were using an Oracle load balancer. Didn't even know Oracle had a load balancer. I certainly have no idea how to configure an Oracle load balancer, but they did and they got it to work. So I definitely would, um, would recommend, like I said, when you're on the right platforms using those and we're gonna go through and actually configure and demo both the Azure load balancer and the AWS load balancing services to work with Parallels Remote Application Server. One of the big new features that we have is SAML. That's that single sign-on where you can kind of um, use that SAML intermediary piece and then tie in a customer's Active Directory or Directory services into SAML and then tie in remote application servers, which we use our, uh, we obviously tie into an Active Directory domain as well. We'll tie all that together so you can get out of the business of having to reset users' passwords and, and uh, manage their accounts specifically. Uh, we'll talk about all that and we'll do a demonstration. We're going to set up SAML soup to nuts um, with Parallels Remote Application Server. So that's going to go through. I also want to do a little bit of uh, kind of troubleshooting and log details. So I want you to introduce you to the Parallels logs because we do quite a bit of logging quite a bit of extensive logging, uh, quite frankly, both on the uh, server side, which is where most of them would be, but also on the client side. I want to introduce you to the logs and then go through some trouble example or troubleshooting examples about how we use those logs. And also introduce you into some other tools uh, that we can use to, uh, or that you can use to kind of uh, maybe prevent problems or um, resolve problems and things like that. The one I'm not going to mention, or the two I'm not going to mention so much, I guess there's a reporting tool which could be used, but also the monitoring. I'm not going to get into that. That covered that it, we're briefly in the basic. That obviously is a tool that you can use. It gives you performance statistics across uh, the entire RAS uh, farm and site. So I'm not going to, I guess the site, because it's set up site by site. I'm not going to get into that or even really talk about that, but you guys should know that's there because you've completed the basic training, right? And then uh, beyond that, there are some additional features uh, that we're gonna cover. I kind of put this all into a single section just because they were a little smaller 
in length in terms of the demos. So just due to length, I didn't break them off into their own um, uh, their own category, if you will. But we are definitely going to cover those. So I'm going to start with the Microsoft Azure VDI and RDSH provisioning. We've got the ability now to um, do auto scaling in Microsoft Azure. So I'm going to talk about that. I'm also going to do a demo. You can see that in action and how that would work. And uh, we've introduced one of the big highly anticipated features people have been wanting for a while, which is really cool, is the Google Authenticator. So I'm going to do a quick demo and talk about that. And then two new, uh, they're not even necessarily new. One of them is kind of new, that administrative folders in publishing and then the ability to do permissions delegations, which simply means, um, you know, certain users can, you know, there's the uh, session management piece that we can do. We can grant access to like help desk or power users to do some basic session management, like send messages out or, uh, you know, maybe log off stock sessions, things like that. You've actually got the ability to do uh, like different groups. Like if I'm in the finance department and I'm kind of the, the go to techie guy there, um, I could actually um, have my IT staff grant me the permission to just do that for the accounting department and not screw up with other departments in case I get a little mischievous or mischievous. So that actually is, a, both of those are functionalities that's in RAS, it's been around for a while, but I don't know that too many people know about them. So I'm going to mention them here and I'm also going to do a demonstration and go through that and a few other uh, things that are related to those in terms of making more of a seamless um, end user experience and also kind of get into just very briefly the, the web console, uh, which is meant for help desk. And then to wrap up, there's actually a handful of other features that were released in version 17.1 that I'm not going to get into very deeply, but I just want to mention them and introduce you to them so that you're aware uh, that they are there. And then you can go to our documentation and knowledge base if you need to look up a little bit more. And then beyond that, uh, we'll actually do a real wrap up. Or I'll kind of wrap up and then we'll take questions. Um, again, use the chat window and that QA window. I tend to watch the chat window a little more than the QA window. It, it just, it's up center and it's kind of popping up on me. On the, I got another screen that kind of has that. Uh, the QA window I will get to, but I don't see those just as much. So you can use either one. The chat window I'll tend to uh, get to a little bit quicker. Please ask your questions as we go through. Um, we can kind of chat on the side as I'm going through this, or I can kind of catch up during the breaks and I'll get close. You don't have to wait all the way to the very end. Um, I'm guaranteed I'll probably miss one or two when I go through there if they scroll by, because like I said, I'm trying to demo and do this at the same time. Uh, but we'll try to get them as best we can. And then if there's some at the end that you think of or we didn't get to, I'll leave a little bit of time at the end where we can ask questions there. But it's all going to be kind of chat based. Uh, like I said, I wish I could to actually talk that's or have you guys talk that's way more interesting and but unfortunately just like i said the audio qualities i talked about earlier will just um, they're not going to be conducive to that okay and we have all these really cool features within parallels remote application server that we've introduced just a dramatic amount of stuff in the uh, years that i've been here big improvement in the product and yet the one thing that hasn't changed is our licensing model I always like to kind of reiterate this. There's still just one licensing model, and that's purely by concurrent user. There is no Advanced Enterprise Platinum Plus Data Center Edition or anything like that. So all these features are available to you just out of the box. The exact um, remote application server product that you've always been using, they're there. The only thing that's not in like the MSI file would be the reporting service, the load balancer, the help, and um, the monitoring service, those are included. There's no charge for those, but there's just a, uh, there, there are different downloads. You don't just deploy right out of the, uh, right out of the standard remote application server MSI installer file. But that's it, everything's included in there. There's no additional, like I said, features or add-ons for any of this. It's all available to you. And of course, as always, uh, not only is support included, but you can always upgrade too once you're ready. So a lot of cool features in 17.1. Uh, we did a few fixes in update one and introduced some features there. So I'm actually going to talk about a couple of features that are specific to uh, version 17.1 update one as well, but all that's included. So none of that has changed in the licensing, which is the really good news. All right, last little bit of housekeeping before we move on. You know, there is the Parallels Partner Portal, Parallels, RAS, partner, or PartnerPRM.com, that link there. 
I don't go into it very often because I don't administrate it. Um, but I do log in once in a while to take a check. But once you log in, you can go ahead and get certified. Uh, click on that link. That may be how many of you found this training if you didn't have an invitation that was sent out. Also in the partner portal, if you scroll all the way down to the bottom, uh, you'll find some information there about how to take the exam. And again, please do take the exam. Uh, that will also happen in the follow-up link. We all occasionally do have uh, just uh, people signing up to take our training that are not partners and they don't have access to the partner portal and, and they want to take the exam. Well, <laughs> it's not really an industry exam. It's just a certification exam to make sure that our partners understand um, the product when we're going out there and, and talking to our joint customers. But you're very welcome, of course, to take the training. We don't you know, charge extra for this. Um, the payment is you get to listen to me for a little bit, right? Okay, and I think um, with that, so let's get rolling. Start with uh, one of my new features in RAS, which is new certificate manager version uh, 17.1. You know, traditionally within RAS, um, if we're going to manage the SSL certs, it was done on a per gateway basis. You had to go to each gateway individually to see what the certificate situation was like there. What we've done uh, in version 17.1 that is really, really cool is we now have a central dashboard. So all the certificates are listed in one place and you can look at it. You can manage this either at the site level or the tenant broker level. The other thing that was really cool is we added the uh, default settings, site default settings for the gateways. You, you've seen this in other places within the interface, I'm sure. But for gateways now, I can manage all the gateways as a whole just by changing the default settings, right? So I've taken a picture of uh, this so that we can see uh, what it can look like. Right, it's just under farm, and then there's the certificates. And then the nice thing, the reason I took this picture is we actually have a couple that are going to expire. So it will actually tell us the certificate status if it's good, if it's going to expire, hey, warning, warning, right, or if it actually is expired. And then whether it's self signed or imported, an imported certificate usually should be one from um, a proper certificate authority. Uh, the certificate usage section that will also uh, specify whether it's available for the RAS gateways or the HAL or both because you actually can assign certificates to either of those entities, right? So you kind of make it pick and choose. And then the rest of the interface is going to be very familiar, right? There's an action button up in the top right, which is the plus that lets us import, generate a new cert request, generate a new self signed request, etc. And then all the certificate management actions are captured and can be viewed later under the settings audit section. So, like I said, if we take a little uh, closer look at the gateway piece, I wanted to show you just the site defaults, right? So here we are under the, here we are under the familiar farm and gateways. But when I go into the properties of one of the gateways, you'll see that inherent default settings and the site defaults that we use elsewhere in the interface. This is really because now if I click on site defaults, I can change the settings for all the gateways at once. So I don't have to go gateway by gateway by gateway by gateway. You know, if you have a larger environment, you'll have a lot of gateways. I don't have to do that. I can modify them all at once. However, that nice little checkbox over there for inherent default settings, <clears throat> what that does is obviously it lets us uh, say this particular gateway it's not going to use the default site settings within RAS. It's going to have its own settings. So you still have the flexibility of having uh, some gateways that kind of do their own thing, their own configuration, if that's a use case for you. But you still uh, would have the option now to manage most of them kind of in mass without having to uh, go gateway by gateway by gateway. This is like I said, a really uh, kind of cool feature. I love the centralization of this. I've been wanting this uh, for years, actually. Okay, and the other thing um, to kind of look at is if we go into the gateway properties, you'll see, and this is whether I'm using the default settings or uh, the site defaults, it's the same, it's just a matter of where I'm changing it. But I actually can go in and see all the certificates that are imported within RAS and pick the one that I want to use. So if all your gateways are using the same one, so it's a wildcard cert or whatever, I can do that. I also can um, pick and choose different certs for different, different gateways. Uh, provided that the certificate was configured to match 
for the resource, right? That it's sent to a gateway or a help. I'll show you where that is in just a second when we go through it. <coughs> the other checkbox that's new in here, actually it's not a checkbox, it's a new setting, the configure setting up there is HSTS, HTTP strict transport security. So a gateway normally accepts both HTTP and HTTPS traffic. Right? That's dependent, of course, on whether your firewall allows that through. But if you want an extra layer of security, you can turn this on, HTTPS on, and it forces the web browser to communicate with the gateway only via HTTPS. So a nice little security setting there. Right? And then the rest of the settings here are ones that are very familiar, right? I can set the SSL version, the cipher strength, the port configuration, just as I always have in here. Okay, so let's go ahead and actually jump over to the product itself and we'll do a quick demo. Okay, so I've logged into our Azure environment here. I just opened up, I published the, uh, the console as an application and went to a web browser and then just launched it in the HTML5 interface. But if I go to farm and then certificates, here's the dashboard that you'll see. And the reason I took a picture of that earlier was we've recently replaced all our certificates and none of these are going to expire anytime soon. Right? They're all green, green and have quite a ways to go. Uh, if I kind of look at them real quick, I can see, first of all, who modified them. And you can see most of them were system and Victor. I've got the two self-signed certs that are in there. Um, I could delete them if I wanted to and clean them up. We just left them in for our demo environment. And then you also can see uh, whether it's been, uh, whether it's self-signed or imported very easily. And then I can go over and also see if it's been assigned to the gateway, the load balancer, or just the gateway. This is where you can see that usage. I'll show you how that comes into play in just a minute. Okay. Um, if I go into a right click and then go to properties on the certificate, I can view all sorts of information about the certificate, right? The name, if I added the description here, you can see under the, uh, I can see the, the key side, the expiration dates and the common name and all that. And I also can see whether it was assigned to a gateway or a load balancer. And I can modify that setting here. Obviously your certificate would have to match whatever it is you're doing there but I could pick and choose and, and change it later if I had to. Uh, the other things I can do actually is go down here and click on the view certificate info. Excuse me, information all about the certificate, you know, the IPs, the identities. Um, it tells me that it was issued to, issued by, even the valid, date, valid from dates. And then uh, there's this issuer statement. If I click on that, that actually opens up a web page here, as you see, and it takes me to the, the certificate authority that I purchased it from. And you can see some of the information that they have about it, their statement. Okay, so I'll go ahead and click OK, and then I'll cancel out of this. And the other thing is very familiar. If I go up and click on the little blue plus, you'll see that I can import a certificate, generate a self-signed certificate, or generate a certificate request, just like I always could. And if I click on just an import a certificate, you'll notice that I can, here's where I would check whether I've got the gateway, the HAL, or both, um, whether it's for one or the other. And where that comes into play is if I move from farm and then go over to gateways, and then I'll go into the properties of one of the gateways here and then, then to the SSL tab. I can select, as I said, the certificates. So all matching usage, the default, um, or I could actually just pick the certificate that I want to use. And this might be, again, a good reason to clean it up a little bit so you don't see too many. But this would only be available, certificates here would only be available if they had the uh, that gateway box that was checked for this. Okay. And then here's the HSTS configuration. You know, essentially you can turn it on and then set the max age and include subdomains and preload. There's a lot of good information about it in the admin guide that kind of gets down into the weeds about what's required for this. So you might want to think about it before you get into that piece or at least take a deeper look at it. Okay. Um, this, like I said, is running in Azure. I showed it to us because it did have um, actually proper certificates in it. But also because it's running on Azure, there's no load balancer. Okay, so I'm going to switch over to my lab environment here. This is uh, just my lab environment. I go to farm and certificates. 
because it's buried so far down inside our, our network, I have just been running off a of self-signed cert. There's no need to really go out and pay for a proper certificate. However, since it is running in my lab and on-prem, I do have a load balancer, uh, which is not available on the other one. So what I wanted to show you here is this is something a lot of people perhaps don't pay attention to. And there's not really a need, I guess, or at least a high demand for it. I haven't come across anybody that's done this, but I wanted to show you this feature. But if I go into the load balance SSL payload and click configure, most people that come in here, they just check the port and then check, check, check all the gateways. But there is this little drop down box pass through for SSL offloading. What's the difference here? Well, it's just where do you want the SSL cert to process, right? If I click on pass through, it's going to go right through the uh, load balancer to the gateway, and the gateway will handle uh, processing and offloading the SSL certificate and decrypting that part. If I set it up to SSL offloading, um, I have to remember to check the gateways again and then go to configure. And then I have the SSL settings here. And again, um, I could see a list of certificates here, but only if they had that howl with the HALB piece, right? So just remember uh, going back, kind of how our ports, right? If you don't have SSL offloading turned on, if you're just going through pass through, you're coming into the load balancer over port 443, most likely. You're coming out of the load balancer over port 443 with the SSL certificates that encryption still intact. And then when I hit the gateway, it will handle the decryption there. If I turn on SSL offloading, then it's going to come into the load balancer over uh, port 443, and then it's going to and strip off that certificate, the SSL cert here, and then pass it on to the gateway over port 80. Okay. So most people I, I actually have not yet come across anybody that wanted to use the SSL offloading for the load balancer, but, but it's there for you. Okay, and with that, we're done with the certificate management demo. Okay, so let's talk about multi-tenancy. We've added some very cool multi-tenancy features to version 17.1. And now there's three different ways that we can design a multi-tenant architecture within Parallels from that application server. We can do a logical isolation, we can do a full isolation, and then the new piece for version 17.1 is the tenant broker. If we think about a logical separation, it's a very traditional and easy way to do that, right? It's just a single RAS farm. Everybody's running in the same active directory, but I'm centralizing, or, or excuse me, managing where end users end up by using organizational units, GPUs, and then RAS filtering policies, okay? So you have very much a shared infrastructure, and then I'm just doing logical isolation. It's very efficient because we're using the shared infrastructure, right? I don't have to build out quite as much infrastructure with it. I only have to open up one port on the external firewall, and I can have either of my users log into just a single common URL or web page, if you will, that is uh, yours, right? The service provider, you're logging into my environment, or if I'd like, I can actually give them all a different look and feel just by giving them a slightly different URL, right? You log into this slash URL, you log into that URL with this tag, and you get a completely different look and feel. So it feels like they're logging into their own environment. You still just have the one address, public IP address that's open on that, right? And then the Active Directory, as I mentioned, would have to be a shared Active Directory, or if you've got different Active Directories going on, or domains, I guess, would be the way to, better way to put that. Uh, there has to be a trusted relationship between them. Very simple, great for certain environments, provided that you can uh, share infrastructure in, in terms of what you're doing. If this doesn't work, um, because you don't, you do have limited physical isolation here, you actually can take the next step, which is in the complete opposite direction, and go with full isolation. So in this case, I've got separate farms per tenant. And I also have a separate Active Directory infrastructure per tenant, and I have separate IPs per tenant that they're logging into. So I have no bleed over whatsoever. There's absolutely no communication between the farms. I have no shared infrastructure. I have a unique public IP and a unique address per tenant. So I have three openings, if you will. And each tenant has to have their own way into the farm. The good news is, that there's no additional parallels licensing cost involved with this, right? Because we license purely by concurrent user. 
So it doesn't matter if you have one farm or 10 farms or 20 farms, it's just how many users do you have connected. This is a very uh, good and powerful way to do things, if you will, just completely isolating the infrastructure. You don't have to worry about bleed over whatsoever. What we've introduced in version 17.1, however, is the concept of tenant broker. And if you look at it, it looks very similar to the other environments, right? I've got a shared infrastructure in that middle tier, the, the connection tier and the connection layer, if you will. I've got my load balancers, I've got the RAS gateways out there, and I even have some publishing agents out there. But all that does is simply operate inside of the tenant broker. When I get to the actual production systems, if you will, where the end users are doing their work, right? The VDI instance, the terminal server instance, even a remote PC, if you were to go that route, look how those are, right? Each one has its own active directory and it has no relationship whatsoever with the other tenants. So it is isolated and managed at a physical level at that point. I can even have a firewall that's separating the different tenants so that they can't get out and get through there. So I've really walled them off. So it's kind of a hybrid approach, right? I've got some shared infrastructure up front, the connection layer, and then I've got an isolated resource layer on the back end. And from the public IP perspective, I just have to have that one public IP that's coming in, and then I can either use a common URL or I could give everybody, actually, you couldn't use a common URL. I'm sorry, I'll show you that in the demo. They would each log into their own URL. It could look the same, but they would each have their own URL, and that's what would send them uh, to the back end into the correct tenants. So you have a unique look and feel for each tenant, although you could duplicate it so it looks the same if you'd like, but they would have their own URL to get through there. So it kind of combines both, right? I've got physical and active directory isolation. I've got no communication between farms, but I get to reduce somewhat my physical infrastructure that's required to get in there. So let's take a closer look at this, right? A closer look at exactly how the tenant broker would work. So obviously in the middle there, I've got the tenant broker piece, which has the shared gateways, the load balancer runs at the tenant broker level, right? All that's there. Um, when I look at the tenant itself, look up at tenant one first, I don't actually have to run the gateway and the load balancer at the tenant if I don't want to. There's no need, right? All that work there is happening up at the tenant broker layer. So I don't have to run it there if I don't want to. In fact, in many cases, I think most people probably wouldn't run it there, right? That's part of the reducing infrastructure and sharing the infrastructure piece and getting some of the cost savings there. But if we look at what I'm doing with here, I can run a separate gateway and load balancer infrastructure down there if I want to, right? Maybe I've got internal users, right? I've got an environment that's kind of on site. Um, people are, do come to the office some and they want to connect through that way traditionally. But when they're outside or remote workers or whatever, I want them coming through my common shared infrastructure externally. So that'll work. The other thing where you might use this as a use case is let's say you're already in play in production and you want to migrate towards using the tenant. Have them keep connecting to the old way, right? Until you get the new infrastructure in place. And then once you've got everybody fully trained and comfortable logging into the old one, then you can shut off the external IP and then start um, turning off the, uh, the, the, the connection layer infrastructure and the tenant. So you can run them both simultaneously. It's possible to connect through a local uh, connection layer infrastructure as well as the tenant broker uh, layer infrastructure simultaneously. That lets you do kind of a, a staged migration, if you will, or staged implementation. And this is more of an engineering document I pulled out of one of our knowledge base articles. You can kind of get an idea when we look at this about what components beyond just the traditional um, or the standard gateway load balancer, publishing agent, VDI, RDSH runs, right? So you can see what runs actually where. So if we take a little closer uh, look at this, or at least call some of it out in the way it works, Every tenant must have a unique public domain address. That's where I kind of misspoke earlier, right? When I said it, they could use the same URL, they can't. So I could simply say, you know, like tenant1.msp.com, tenant2.msp.com, and so forth. But it would map a single um, IP address that you've exposed publicly. But that different address, and I'll show you how to configure that when we do the demonstration, that different address is what actually directs them to whether they're going to tenant one, tenant two, or whatever. So they use a different URL that will send them to the appropriate uh, farm. 
if they type in the wrong URL, well, they're still not, you know, they're still not in trouble because they don't have credentials to get into that environment, right? They would, they would have nothing, no active directory or anything to get into that, so they'd be locked out, okay, if they go to the wrong one. The themes, the web themes are defined at the tenant level, okay? So when you do that look and feel, you're actually be logging into the tenant level and going into themes and, and changing that. That's a little bit separate, right? We've split the tenant themes or the themes off a little bit from the gateway under the cover. So you don't really notice this so much when you're doing the configuration, but remember that the HTML5 gateway and that web interface exists at the tenant broker level here, but the themes are still defined at the tenant level, not at the tenant broker level. Okay. SSL certs, they're going to be defined generally at the tenant broker level. Why do I say generally? Well, it's possible, again, that you could run a gateway infrastructure inside each tenant as well as the tenant broker, which case, if it is public facing, you're going to want to have certs there. But typically, if you don't have gateways inside each tenant, you can manage the certs all just at the tenant uh, broker level, the connection layer level. You don't have to go in there and manage them for each um, individual tenant farm if you, if you don't want to. You don't have to, right? Especially if you don't have gateways, I guess you can't at all. Two-factor two authentication settings are defined at the farm level, right? The tenant farm level, not in the connection uh, layer level, but the tenant broker. So let's think about that, right? The benefits that that gives us. I can now have a single infrastructure where end users come into, but tenant one perhaps uses the Google Authenticator. Tenant two may use Azure MFA, right? Tenant three might use Duo and so forth, right? I can have a different two-factor authentication um, system for each one of my clients. I could even have tenant four that has no 2FA. They don't want to pay you for it, so they don't get it. Oh, we don't need it, right? Like that. So you define the 2FA settings at the tenant farm level. Uh, from a licensing standpoint, um, from a big picture standpoint, there's no change to the license, right? We don't license per feature. It's just purely concurrent user. So this doesn't cost you anything extra. But the tenant broker uh, has no licensing whatsoever. You can install the tenant broker and they don't ask you for a license key. So you don't need to plug in a key up into that, into that part of it. You can just install it and run with it. The production pieces, right, the actual farm themselves, those do have licenses. That's where you would put your license key or your splock key or whatever at that level. But no key needs to go into the tenant uh, broker level. The tenants can be separate RAS farms, so they could be completely independent and have nothing to do with each other. You also could have them be separate RAS sites if you get into the site infrastructure, if you remember about that, right? So they can be separate sites as well. Uh, let's see what else. Oh, parallel clients, right? The clients are going to have to be version 17.1 or greater. And uh, that would mean that WISE is not supported through the tenant broker. It's just the type of client can't handle it. So if you use the DHCP configuration settings for WISE, it's not supported through the tenant broker. You can still use WISE, of course. We're not decommissioning WISE when you stretch the imagination. But WISE would have to have um, connect to the farm directly. You'd have to have gateway components inside the RAS tenant farm itself and then have the WISE clients connect to that. Uh, they would not be able to function and work. It's not capable of WISE. Uh, uh, infrastructure where it is now. But the clients in general have to be version 17.1 or later. So if you're running on an older version of the client, uh, they're going to have to upgrade them in order to be able to use the tenant broker piece. And then the last piece uh, to talk about, of course, is the RAS farms. All the tenant farms are going to have to be at version 17.1 or later. Obviously, there's no tenant broker available in an earlier version of RAS. But the tenant farms, you have to get them up to version 17.1 before they can recognize and interact with the tenant broker. Okay, so let's go ahead and do a demo. I'm going to install the tenant broker and then we're going to connect to a couple of tenants and show you how the whole process works. So to install the tenant broker, I'm just going to run the RAS installer. It's just the regular RAS installer that we download uh, and install all the time, right? And just go next, you know, always accept the license agreement, you know, take the defaults here. This is the new option, right? All I have to do is select RAS tenant broker and then kind of let it go. Firewall rules, I don't need to install the single sign-on. That is, again, for the administrator console. It has nothing to do with single sign-on for the end users. I'm not going to bother with it for this. I'll just go ahead and run install. 
So literally, other than selecting the tenant broker, I just took the defaults. Okay, I sped that up for us a little bit. So I'll then launch the RAS admin console. Okay, once that's complete, I can just go ahead and log into the tenant broker, right? Similar like we would always do. I can put in local host. I'm creating the first administrator user. I'm gonna let it remember my credentials so I don't have to keep typing them in all the time. Notice I'm not specifying a domain here. This is installing on a standalone server. It's not joined to any of the domains that I have. So I'm gonna go ahead and click connect. And we're gonna go ahead and log in. And here's the tenant broker. You can see everything looks pretty green, green and good. I've got a little bit of high CP or RAM usage, but that's all right, it'll settle down. But uh, it's really just a RAS farm, the same tools and format that we all know and love, but it's missing a few things, right? It doesn't have, um, it doesn't have the RD session host or VPA or the publishing information or policies or anything like that, because it's not doing any of that. It's just providing the shared infrastructure of the gateways and the HALB, if we wanted to add that, and the publishing agent. So just like a regular RAS farm, I could add a second publishing agent, I could configure a HALB, I could do gateways, any of that to create as much redundancy as I want. The one thing that is a little bit different is up here on the tenants, right? I can go, this is where I actually would add the tenants in. Now, before I do this, I wanna show you what I've got set up in DNS. So let me minimize this and I'll open up a command prompt. I've taken down all my Windows firewalls so we can ping and see what's going on. But this particular server is called, um, here it is, uh, cert-tb. I'm gonna ping it using IPv4 so we can kind of see what's going on. So I'll go ahead and just ping itself and it's replying from a dot .44 address, right? I've also defined two other um, DNS entries in my DNS server, one of which is called cert s one praslab.local, and when I ping that, notice it's also pinging to dot .44. That's what the tenant one um, is gonna use when they log in. And then the other one I've done is cleverly named cert-s2.praslab.local. And that also pings to dot .44. Why does this matter? Well, it I'm pinging really the gateway piece of this. It has nothing else to do with any of the other pieces of the RAS server, but it's the gateway server because I'm running in my lab. But this is what you need to do to set up a multi-tenant architecture if you were having real customers in production coming in over the internet. Except you wouldn't be pinging a, a 10 dot address, right? You would be, um, we wouldn't be pinging anything probably, but you'd be uh, resolving that address to your external address, right? So the tenant one, remember, uh, would resolve to the external address, the external IP. The tenant two URL would also resolve to the external IP. And then of course that external IP would map to a RAS component such as um, the IP, virtual IP address of the load balancer, or if you're a very small environment or just testing it out, perhaps just a single gateway like I'm doing here. But that's really all I'm doing is setting that up because you'll see this cert-s1.praslab.local and cert.s2.praslab.local when I configure the tenants. So let me break out of this. I'm gonna go back into my tenant broker console again. And I'm going to uh, go to farm and tenants, and then here's a little blue plus. And I'm going to add the tenants. So we'll start with um, tenant one. And then from the public I, you know, domain address, this is that address that um, they're actually going to connect to. So this one would be cert-s1.praslab.local. Uh, okay, and that's it. And then to make the connection, we have an invitation hash, right, that you would use. If I'd gone into administration and configured the mail server, I could have mailed it to myself or to an address wherever the tenant itself lies. But since I'm just in the lab and can just RDP into different servers, I'm just gonna go ahead and copy this, right? And I'll click okay. And then I will, it tells me that the, it's not joined. So I can click apply. But I will then move over to my uh, RAS farm that I'm going to join. So this is a RAS farm that's already up and running, right? And if you look at it, I can go to the site information here so we can look at the dashboard. It's already fully functional. It's got a HALB, it's got gateways and all that, but I want to retire this info, this infrastructure here and move people to the tenant infrastructure. So that's easy to do. So I'm controlling this server um, or this farm under farm site, and I just go to tasks and then I click join the tenant broker and then I paste that hash in. Right. When I do that, 
Part of the hash also includes the tenant broker address, so it knows where to go to talk to. And I click join. Hey, it applied, it worked, right? I click OK, and then apply is already done. And now I just have to wait, as you can see, it's synchronizing. And this should come back in just very quick if I just refresh a little bit. And that'll sync up. And if I go back to the uh, tenant broker side, you can see it starts at not verified, and then it'll sync itself up in just a moment. There we go. Now it's okay. I go back over here and I refresh, and that's okay too. So now it's working. So I could just connect, open up a web browser and connect to certain hs onepresslablocal and it would send it right all the way through. But let's go ahead and do another tenant, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and create another one. And what I'm gonna create is, let's go back to this farm. I actually created two sites in the same farm just to keep it simple so I could show you this from a single pane of glass be too uh, related to each other at all, remember? They could be two completely separate farms on different Active Directory infrastructure. But just to keep life easy, I'm gonna switch and manage the second site. Remember, that's how sites work. I manage one and then the other. Um, this one's really kinda getting pounded, but that's okay. So how do I differentiate these from a little bit? Well, I changed the theme. The other one is all at the default theme. I left it with the red logo that we all are used to when we first see. Here, I went ahead and switched the colors on the theme to blue. So when you see blue, you notice we're connecting to this one, and when you see red, you're connecting to the other one, okay? So this is the one I'm gonna add and connect to. So let's go back to the tenant broker, and I'm gonna add this one in. So I'm under tenants and farm. I'll click the blue plus. This one I will cleverly name tenant two. And the public I, uh, domain address for this one is cert-s2.prasslab.local. And I'll grab this hash here, right? And I'll go back over here and I'm gonna go to tasks and say, join the tenant broker and I'll plug in the hash and I'll go ahead and click okay and, or join rather. And then what I get back is, uh oh, yeah, I did that on purpose, right? So you get this error here and you're wondering what, what the heck's going on, the tenants is expired or something. That's not what's happening, right? I, if I go back over here, I forgot to click OK. That happened to me once, and so I got that weird error, and I thought I would just kind of show it to you guys as a troubleshooting step. Once you copy this, go ahead and click OK and close it. You might even want to click Apply, right? Then I can go back over here and go to Join. And this time when I plug in that little hash and click Join, it works like a champ, right? So just don't forget to click OK on the other side. And this will take a minute or two to sync as well. Like I said, there we go, even though I'm having CPU issues on this uh, particular server. Uh, okay, so that's all done and we're ready for it, to, for it to roll. So let's go back over here and I'll just open up a web browser. And I thought I had, um, I had Chrome installed. All right, we'll just use IE. IE should work just fine. Yeah, I turned off the enhanced security, so we're good. So from here, I can literally just type in uh, https.cert-s1.prislab.local, and I don't need that cert tab. And then I'll go ahead and click continue, and here we go. It went ahead and connected right, right through the broker. So, and you can tell this is tenant one, it says login tenant one. I did change the theme a little bit and then it's got the red. So then I go to the other one and I'll open up a new tab and type in HTTPS colon forward slash, uh, forward slash and I'll call this one cert-s2.praslab.local. And then here we go. And this one is blue and it says tenant two. So that's really it, right? Um, the main thing is just don't uh, adjust that URL because the URL that your tenants type, your different customers type, is what's going to send them into it. One other little thing I forgot to mention back on my uh, second site, you'll notice this one doesn't have a gateway or load balancer to it, right? So just like I showed you my diagram, I didn't, this is brand new. I configured it specifically for use with the tenant broker. And so I didn't put those in there because I don't need them. The only way to get to this site is to go through the tenant broker itself. And yet the theme settings are right here. And this is where I could adjust the themes. So even though the gateways aren't here, I can still play with and adjust the themes. Okay. All right. 
So that's really it for um, the tenant broker demo. Okay, so let's talk about load balancing on Azure and AWS with Parallels Remote Application Server. We all know that Parallels ships with its own load balancer, the HALB, right? The High Availability Virtual Appliance, the uh, HALB that, that ships with a product. It's great if you've got an on-premise solution up to about 2,000 users. It's not a good option though for cloud-based environments. And the reason for that is simply that adding a virtual appliance to a cloud-based solution adds a lot of cost and complexity from the cloud provider. It's much better to use the native cloud-based load balancing uh, instead of running on a cloud platform. And it's really easy to do, you know, from a very high conceptual level, you're simply lifting out our help, our load balancer, and replacing it with the load balancer on the cloud provider, you know, Azure or uh, AWS in this examples, right? So I'm going to demonstrate both how to do Azure and AWS load balancer configuration in just a moment, but I want to spend a little time thinking about gateways in general. It kind of helps us get the big picture of what we're really trying to do. First, let's go back to the basics and think about ports, right? The load balancer, we're going to be bringing port 80 or port 443 into the load balancer and out of the load balancer. Most likely, if this is internet facing, it's going to be just 443, right? Port 80 is for unencrypted traffic. And of course, you can change the ports if you want to. You just have to remember to change them on the RAS gateway components and the fact that the clients will, uh, the Parallels clients will also be defaulting to 443, so you'd have to specify something else. Okay, so 80 or 443 in and out of the load balancer, usually 443. Also, we have port 80 or 443 going into the gateway component itself, right? So you've got the past traffic in both directions to the load balancer like that. But coming out of the gateway servers, that's where we use the RDP port 3389. That's the only place that we make the connection on that port to a remote desktop server, a virtual desktop, or a remote PC, or whatever is using that. So that's the only time that that port needs to be exposed. You can change it if you want, although I haven't had anybody actually do that yet. But that's the only place buried way, way down in your environment and nowhere near uh, internet facing for that piece that uh, some people don't necessarily think about is that the gateway virtual machines do not have to be joined to Active Directory. They don't have to be. They can be. It's a heck of a lot easier to manage them when they are, right, because you don't have to deal with permissions and so forth. But they don't have to be if you're worried about security. They also don't need direct access to the internet. Right? Even in our environment, we prefer that, or even in an on-prem environment, we prefer that the direct access to the internet to the load balancers, virtual appliance lockdown system, you know, a smaller attack surface, if you will. Same thing in the cloud environment, right? I'd rather have the load balancer for the cloud actually interface with the internet and then not have uh, the gateway systems do it. And you can if you have to in your very small environment, but best practice would be don't, don't do that. The other thing too that I want to kind of revisit that can trip people up sometimes is the gateway redirection features. Right. There's two uh, redirections that we have available within the gateway that can make life easier for the end users. The first one is we'll redirect HTTP to HTTPS, right? essentially redirecting port 80 traffic to port 443 traffic. It's really nice if a user forgets to type in the S and they just type in HTTP, we'll automatically fill it in for them. However, think about that. That redirection is happening at the gateway component, which, as I said, is probably not interface, uh, interfacing to the internet and is buried behind the firewall a little bit. So for that to work, an end user would have to get all the way to the gateway over port 80 before we translate that over to port 443. Okay. And obviously these are what just to be clear on that one. I have had some customers that do that. They're pretty security savvy and they kind of know what they're doing. Uh, personally, um, and I'll kind of leave that up to you whether you want to do it or not. Uh, but if you do want that redirection to be available, you do have to have port 80 open all the way to the gateway because that's where it happens, at least from within RAS. You may be able to have your own tools that do the redirection yourself, but within Parallels Remote Application Server, that's where it occurs. The second one also is very handy, the second redirect that we use. An end user has the ability to type in just, let's say, HTTPS 
forward slash forward slash and then the address typically on site it would be the host name or the, the virtual IP address of the load balancer just type that in and then RAS will go ahead and redirect them to the HTML5 web page right so we'll go ahead and append the piece that kind of gets them there automatically it's very handy particularly for an on-prem environment it works great off-prem as well, uh, you know, in the cloud or coming in over the internet. But if you're not aware of what's going on and how that mechanism works, this is where it can trip you up. Let's take a little closer look at what's going on. You can see these settings down within the RAS administrator console under farm and the gateways and the properties of the gateway. And then there's a web tab. It used to say web request. Now it just says the web tab. And here we notice that the default address for the HTML5 interface actually is HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash the server name slash RAS HTML5 gateway. You got to have the whole thing in there in order to get to the HTML5 web page. And the redirect, as I talked about, simply means that you could type in HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash the server name or the address name, and it will append the RAS HTML5 gateway to it automatically. So the users can type in kind of the shorter URL and it'll pen the longer URL automatically, which gets them to the web page. So kind of nifty, but it can have a problem if you think about coming in over the internet and you leave it at the defaults, right? You've got an external address that you've gotten added, right? To an internal address that ultimately gets to RAS and the gateway servers, right? So if a user types in that short name, HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash external address and hits enter, they're going to get redirected. It's going to hit the gateway and redirect, but look what it's going to redirect them to. HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash server name slash RAS HTML5 gateway, the default. If you look at my server name, my server name is just what I named the Windows server, pras one That's the default. Well, guess what? That pras one is not the internet, right? The internet and all the servers out there and the names resolution and DNS and blah, blah, and all that has no idea what pras one is. So the users will type in the HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash external address, they'll get redirected, and then they're gonna get a page not found because what the heck is Prazo one So to get around that, you need to modify the settings under this web uh, tab here. Or you could just type in the whole thing. So either way will work. You could just tell your user, type in the whole string, HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash external address slash RAS HTML5 gateway. If you type in the whole thing, it'll work. The other way, and probably really the better way, would be to change the default URL so that it says HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash external address slash slash RAS HTML5 gateway. You can do that right here. Take out the local host name part of the default URL and replace it with your external address. And at that point, it'll work just fine. Okay. So let's go ahead and actually create a load balancer on Azure to use with LLS remote application server. There's several steps that we're going to follow to do this. It's all documented in a knowledge base article that you see here. It gives you all the steps that you need to do. We're going to start by going into the Azure portal itself and creating an availability set. Then we'll create virtual machines within Azure as part of that availability set. And these are going to be our gateway. We're going to install the RAS gateway component on them. Okay, then we're going to go ahead and create an Azure load balancer, we'll create a back end pool, we'll create a health probe, and then we'll test and evaluate the solution. Okay, so let's go ahead and log into the Azure portal and create an availability set. So I'll get up to my environment up there, click add, and then in the search in the marketplace, I'll type in availability, yep, and choose availability set right here, and then we'll go ahead and click create. There it is, it's in the right subscription, the right resource groups, and I'll go ahead and give it a name, and we'll call it RAS uh, GW, right, for gateways. And uh, my environment is not in Japan, I'm in the west coast of the United States, so let's put it in US West 2. And let's see, there we go, US West 2. And uh, the rest of these settings I think are fine. So I could just click review and create here. If you wanna take a look at some of the advanced settings, right, we can go ahead and click on those. I'll just go next. I'm not gonna change anything, but these are the tags and stuff. If you wanna take a look at them, go ahead and I guess if just click create without changing anything. And then I'll speed this up 
so that we don't have to wait for it. Okay, there we go. All done. Look at that. So let's go to the resource and look. There they are. And now we need to create the virtual machines, right? So we need to create a couple of Windows virtual machines that I can put in the availability set and add the RAS gateway component to. So let's um, go ahead up here to my environment again, and then we'll click on Add. And let's see, there's Windows 2016 Data Center on top. You know what? Let's do 2019. Let's go crazy, right? Keep current. So we'll go Windows, Server, 2019. There it is. And hey, Data Center. Yeah, you know what? That's good enough for this. We'll just go ahead with Data Center. Why not? So go ahead and click Create. And then it's in, again, the right subscription and resource group, so I can just go ahead and give it a name. This is going to be our first gateway server, so I'll call it Res uh, one There we go. And again, I'm not in Asia. I'm located in the West Coast in the U.S., so we'll put it up in U.S. West. And an availability group, right? That's kind of why we did this. I want an availability set. And let's give it, um, we already have one. We just created right, RASGW. Notice, though, I actually could have created it right here. So I could have created it on the fly if I wanted to and saved me a step. And let's go ahead and change the size. RAS gateways, two processors, four gigs of memory. If the gateway is running all by itself, that's plenty. That's support about mm, 750 users, maybe a little bit more. I'm going to go ahead and log in with Victor's credentials. That way he can handle the billing, right? It's all his. Make sure it's in his uh, billing group. You're welcome, Victor. Makes my life easier, right? Why not? And let's see. There we go. I'll confirm the password. And then um, I really don't want these guys coming in over 3389. That'd be a big no-no. Let's just keep this internet facing encrypted so 443 only right so i'll get rid of the 3389 there and then the rest of it's fine i'll just go next um, that's fine i'll just leave it with that and let's see there's my public IP. You know what? I'm going to leave the public IP here. It just makes it a bit easier for managing. Um, you can go ahead and do this if you'd like this. You probably want to take that away at the end, so don't forget to do that. You don't need a public IP uh, for the gateways. Uh, the load balancer will handle that, right? But I'll just leave it there for now, and I'll just go to next, and review and create. There we go. Okay, so that's the first one going. Let's go ahead and create the second virtual machine. So I'll just do the same process as my deployment is underway, All right? So I'll go up here and click Add, and then Windows, let's just be consistent, 2019 server. I could mix and match if I want, but why bother with that? So I'll call this one RAS Gateway 02. I'll put it in US West 2, and um, I'll speed this up a little bit so we can kind of get through here since we've already seen what I've done. But essentially the same settings, two processors, four gigs of memory. Oops, I actually think I clicked on eight, and it doesn't matter for this. Log in with Victor's credentials again. And there we go, 443, not 3389 for the gateway components on the inbound connections and create. And I've sped it up, so this will be done very fast for us. There we go. All right, don't have to wait. Okay, so with that, let's move on and we'll go ahead and install the RAS uh, gateway components next. So let's go to the RAS administrator console. And I'll go to Farm and Gateways, and then I'll click on our little blue plus up in the top right there. And the first server is uh, RASGW01. Make sure it resolves so DNS is working, right? We're going to enable the HTML5 interface and the firewall rules, and I'll click Next and Install, and I'll let this go, and I'll speed this up so we don't have to wait for this. And it'll be done very fast. Done. And let's go ahead and go through the same process again, RASGW02. And I'll speed this one up since we're just doing the same thing so we can get it done. Okay. So that's just about done. Uh, there we go. Done. I'll click on done. We always click apply. All right. And then our little uh, RAS monitor is telling me that, yeah, the services aren't online yet. I'll click refresh a couple of times. And there we go. Green, green. All good. Okay. And then with that, we can move back over to the Azure portal. Let me get back into uh, my environment that's up there. Right. And there we go. And then let's go ahead and add a load balancer. So I'll click add. Start typing load balancer in the marketplace. There it is. And there's a load balancer. Click create. All right. And, uh, yep, all that's good. Let's go ahead and give it a name. So we'll call it RAS-LB. There we go. And it's, of course, in U.S. too. So we'll get to that. U.S. West uh, 2. 
there we go. Okay, public is where it's facing. The rest of the SKUs are good there. And we definitely want to create, let's go ahead and create a new public uh, IP address name. So we're going to create a public IP address and we'll create a public IP address name. So I'll just call this ras dash uh, LB dash, I don't know, IP, right? How boring. There we go. Okay, so that's done. Uh, we don't want it to be dynamic. I want it to be static. People are really connecting to this. I don't want it changing all the time. Okay, so static it is. That's the best practice. And then from here, we can go ahead. We're done. So let's go ahead and click review and create. Okay, so that'll create for us. I'll speed it up so it creates fairly quickly. We passed the validation test, and now we're actually creating it. Okay, there we go, underway, and now it's just about done. Okay, so let's take a look at it. We'll go to the resource itself. And from here, now we can create the other things that we need to do. So let's start with the backend pools. So from within the load balancer, I can click on uh, backend pools right there. Okay, and then I'll click add. We're going to add a pool. So here's the add button. And then let's call it, uh, we need to give it a name. So let's call it... Uh, Let's see, ras dash lb lb dash pool. Okay, that's there. And then the virtual network, these are our gateway systems, right? They don't need to be public facing. That's what the load balancer is for. So I'm just going to put it on the lab net, right? And then what are we going to associate this back end pool to? Well, we need to point it to our two gateway systems. So I'm just going to go ahead and choose under associated to a uh, virtual machine, right? Actually, virtual machines. I'll add both of them. So virtual machine is RAS uh, Gateway 01, and then I'll add the other one too, which is RAS Gateway 02, and I don't want to forget to do the IP address either, right? <laughs> so I'll choose that one. And uh, 10 dot, notice it's on a 10 dot. It is internal. It does not need to be public facing. So there they are. I actually could have gone and done a uh, virtual machine scale set if I'd set that up, but with just two virtual machines in this little environment doing a... Um, just brute force and add the two virtual machines manually here is perfect. So I'll go ahead and do that. Click add and that's rolling along. Okay, it'll speed this up for us and they're done. So there's the back end pool and you can see it has both our virtual machines in it, RAS Gateway 01 and 02. So now I'll click on health probes from within the load balancer and we're going to add a health probe. So I'll go up there and click on add. And let's give it a name, and this will be RASLB dash um, oh, probe. Okay. Or no, actually, you know what? Let's use uh, TCP443. That way it'll probe over the ports uh, that I want to do, because that's what actually we're going to be testing is that. So the protocol is TCP, and the probe is 443, right? The health probe, what I want to do is make sure that it's going to check that our both our gateways are up. If one of them's not answering on 443 or one of them's down, there's no point in load balancing people to that. So we'll go ahead and create that. That'll make sure that they're up and it actually functions and sends people to a port that are a gateway that's up. Okay, so let's actually do the load balancing rules. So I clicked on load balancing and I'm adding the rule here. And RAS LB, uh, I'm going to do the same thing, TCP443, because that's what we're actually load balancing is that port. IPv4 is fine. There's our public IP address from Azure. And the protocol is TCP. And then the port, uh, we're going to switch that to 443. So incoming connection, 443. Back end, it's going to come out to 443. Right? We're coming in and out of 443. The gateways will handle it from there. Back end pool is set. The health probe is set. And let's change the session persistence to client IP and protocol. Okay? So that's good. I don't really need to change these other things. So I can go ahead and click on OK. And that'll handle that. All right. Okay, so that's created and done. Sped that up for us. There we go. There's our rule. I'm going back in here because I want to get the public IP address. Okay, because now we're going to test it out. So I'll go ahead and um, copy that. And let's move over to our load balancer. Now, I haven't set up the web redirection yet within Parallels RAS, so I'm going to have to use the full name here, HTTPS, colon, slash, slash, and then the public IP address I put in, and then the RAS HTML5 gateway uh, tag. Let me get through the um, self-signed certificate. There we go. Hey, it's working. Look at that. All right. 
So the load balancer is working, RAS is working. Let's just go ahead and clean up that web redirection. So back to the RAS console under farm and gateways, I could either uh, select the gateway, right click properties, double click, or I can go over here to tasks and then properties. Okay, and then I'll go to the web tab. And site defaults, great new feature. I can change it for all the gateways at once. I'll replace the host name part of that tag with the public IP address, click okay, always click apply. Done, right, that's it, that quick. So let's go back to our web browser. Now what I can do is strip out that RAS HTML5 gateway tag. I don't have to add it when I type it in. I can just do the HTTPS public IP address and there it works, voila, success. So we have successfully created an Azure load balancer and integrated it with Parallels Remote Application Server. That's it. So let's switch gears and look at Amazon Web Services and what it takes to balancer running on AWS with RAS. All the steps that we're going to be going through are documented in a knowledge-based article that I have listed here, but essentially we're just going to log into the EC2 dashboard, choose the load balancer type, configure it, then we'll configure the routing and register the targets, the targets being the RAS gateways, review and create the load balancer, finalize the configuration, and then of course test and evaluate. Okay, so let's go ahead and log into the EC2 dashboard and we'll start configuring. So first off, we do have two running instances up here already, and they both have the, um, the Parallels RAS gateway component already installed on them. So those are the two pieces that we're actually going to be load balancing. Okay, so let's go back to the dashboard and we'll actually go ahead and create a load balancer. Okay, so we'll go down to load balancers and we'll go click create load balancer. And the type we're going to pick is a network load balancer because that's what we're doing. So load balancing 443 connections. So let's call it RAS certification. And then for, uh, it has to be internet facing, right? For like use. And then TCP UDP, that would be the preferred method. So we can use both protocols. It could also work with TCP, but TCP UDP is better. And then don't forget to change that port, right? 443, so make sure that's the port. And let's put it in the uh, zone that we want. And we're in US East 1B is where the rest of this is. So that's it. So let's go ahead and click next and we'll configure the routing. All right, so the target name, we'll just call it uh, RAS Gateway GW TCP UDP. Again, make sure that port is 443 and uh, that's good. It's just TCP for the health checks. We just wanna make sure that TCP is running, right? Make sure it's up and we'll just leave that alone. The rest of them are fine. And then we're gonna add our instances to it and register the targets, right? So add to the register. Again, those are the two gateways that we've already configured. We'll go on next and we'll review and then we'll go ahead and create. Okay, so that's it. It was really fast. And then all we need to do is just watch the state up here that's provisioning and it'll switch to active very soon. There we go, it's active. Uh, we usually give it a couple of minutes to kind of settle. If you go into it too fast, it's not gonna work. Uh, but Give it a minute, but meantime, let's go ahead and change the load balancer attribute deregistration delay to zero seconds. So we'll go in here to edit attributes and then just change this delay to zero. That's in the knowledge base article, by the way. So we'll save that. And with that, there it is. It's all good, it's active and it's ready to use. So let me go ahead and grab the public DNS name right here. And then I'll go ahead and copy and paste this into a web browser. But remember, we haven't done the web redirection yet. So I'm gonna add the RAS HTML5 gateway tag. There we go. And then when I hit enter, we'll probably hit the self-signed certificate. And there it is. That means that we're actually hitting the RAS server, the gateway server. So good. We'll just plow right through this. And we will see, in fact, that it is up. There we go. Success. Okay. So let's go ahead and adjust the web redirection, right? Like we did before. So we'll go to farm gateways. We'll go to the properties of the gateway here and web request, and then I'll change it for everything under site defaults, and then we'll take out that local server address and we'll add in the public address, and with the tag afterwards, and then once that's done, we can go ahead and click, um, finish typing in the HTTPS, don't want to forget that part either. <clears throat> okay, so now we're good. We'll click okay, okay, Go ahead and click apply and let's try it out. So now I should just be able to type in the public address without the tag, right? And when I hit enter, we should all be good. So, whoops, <laughs> look at that. I made a typo in the web redirection settings, HTML gateway, not HTML5 gateway. 
So let's go back and we'll fix that. I'll go back into the properties or the gateways web. There it is under site defaults. Let me just add that little five in there. It has to have the full RAS HTML5 gateway to work, as you see. So, okay, and apply. Now we can go back and this time I'll just type in HTTPS in the public address without that tag. And there we go. Voila, it works. So that's how you can configure a Amazon Web Services load balancer to work with parallels. And with that, I think we've earned a break. So I'm going to set the timer for 20 minutes and let's go break. See you in 20 minutes, folks.
Welcome back, everybody. Hope you all had a nice break. Okay, let's move on and we're going to talk about SAML. This is kind of a big topic, actually. It's uh, one of the bigger features that we have in uh, version 17.1. It's one of those that I definitely pre recorded and I'm just going to live narrate over because there's a lot of steps to get through. I always like to start with the diagram so we can kind of get a picture overview of what's happening. So, from a high level, you as service providers want to get out of the business of managing end user accounts, right? Users coming and going at your various customers, changing passwords, et cetera, things like that. You'd like to be out of that business. And the customers themselves, they would like to be able to use their own accounts, right? Maybe their own email address, and their own password to log in and not have to keep track of the second one to get to the services that you're providing. And that's where SAML comes in. SAML is kind of that uh, full-on integration. It starts with a third-party kind of identity provider provided by Azure or Okta or SafeNet. It ties in the customer's directory and authentication services to that, the identity providers, and it also provides your configuration in your Active Directory to the, uh, to the identity provider. So it's all neatly tied in together. So why do you still have to have your own Active Directory of SAML and the uh, customers handling it as well? Well, think what they're logging into. It's a remote desktop server or terminal server if you prefer. It's a Windows server. It requires Active Directory for authentication. You also have a user for everybody logging in. There's just no way around that. That's how Active Directory works. But the customers don't need to know about that exact user account, right? We're going to do some mapping between that so that the passwords and everything is managed on the customer side. And we do that through an entity that we have in RAS called the enrollment server, which ties into SAML. If we take a little closer look at the enrollment server, like I said, it's just a separate component within RAS. It deploys from the RAS console like other RAS components, right? Go into enrollment servers under farm and click the little blue plus and push it out. It's a little bit different in that it must run on its own server with no other RAS components. Okay, it won't even let you install it uh, on a PA or a gateway or anything like that, like the other RAS components will let you double up. This one won't even let you do that. Also, think about what it's doing, right? It should be a secure, dedicated server, similar to a domain controller or certificate authority. And um, a couple other nice things about it is you can use multiple enrollment servers for high availability, right? So you can just deploy another one, another one. They'll run active actives. They're all doing work for you in case one fails. Uh, they do have to share the same registration key, and there's a few other little quirks and things about them, but it's all in the documentation, and you'll see where all that is when we go through and do the demonstration. So let's move on, and we'll go ahead and take a look at the prerequisites before we kind of get into the actual demonstration and setting all this up. Uh, the Parallels Remote Application Server Admin Guide has all of this information. I pulled a lot of it out of that. There's also a knowledge base article, but I actually like the admin guide a little bit better. It's got a little bit more detail, um, presents a little bit better, and so forth. But from a prerequisite standpoint, let's first look at your Microsoft Active Directory. This is your Active Directory where the RAS components are installed. As I mentioned, we do have to install or create rather two users, an enrollment agent user and an NLA user. The enrollment agent user is used to enroll certificates to the RAS enrollment server on behalf of the user. And then the NLA user actually will be used to initiate the connection uh, to the RDSH instance or VDI desktop, whatever you're doing. Uh, that NLA user is a little interesting, right? It, it kind of has to have two almost um, uh, diametrically opposing roles. It, it, it needs to be a member of the remote desktop users group so that it can log in on behalf of the user. Uh, it uses a virtual smart card to do that. But we also don't want people to hijack this and then kind of use that by itself. And so we also would like to set up a group policy that would deny login through remote desktop services. And we'll do both of this in the both of these in the demonstration. You're going to have to have a Microsoft Enterprise Certification Authority running with certain templates, Enrollment Agent Certificate Template, and the Smart Card Logon Certificate Template. And uh, obviously, you have, have a third-party identity provider. We're not going to spend too much time with this, although I'm going to go ahead and leisure, uh, leverage the Azure AD when we do the demo. And then your domain controllers. They're going to have to have some domain controller certificates, and they're going to have to support smart card authentication. What's the deal with the smart cards? Why do I keep bringing that up? Well, that's kind of the magic that we're doing under the covers, right? We're injecting a virtual smart card into Active Directory on behalf of the user, and that's what actually allows the, the login process to happen is by using virtual smart cards. 
All right, so let's go ahead and configure the whole thing soup to nuts. I've already got a RAS farm configured using what I'm going to call my local AD. And then we've got, um, I'm going to use Azure AD as the identity provider. So the first thing is to remember to create those two service accounts for RAS inside my local AD, if you will. That's what my RAS farm is joined to. So I'll go ahead and create a new user. And this will be the enrollment agent user. All right, so we'll just call this um, SSO. Let's see, it's fixed here, SSO. Uh, maybe I'll do like uh, SSO agent. So that'll be the enrollment uh, agent user. I'm calling it SSO agent. Let me go ahead and give them a password. And I'll go ahead and uh, confirm that password. And then uh, this is an account I really don't want that password expiring on me. So I'll do that. All right, that one's done. So let's go ahead and create the other one. And I'll do the, uh, the NLA user here. All right, so I'll go ahead and just create the new user there. And NLA, and you know, just be consistent. I'll call this one, I guess, NLA agent. I'm going to go ahead and do the same thing by setting the passwords for it here. Let's hope I don't fat finger the uh, confirmed password. Hopefully that'll work. And this is another one too. I really don't want the password expiring or changing on me. It'll take things down. Next day, hey, look at that. Good, finish. No fat fingering. Okay, so remember that SSO agent. That's the enrollment agent user. It's the account used to enroll certificates to the RAS uh, enrollment server on behalf of the authenticated user. So what I need to do is go ahead and um, delegate control for that, so I'll just right click on the users container and delegate control just to the whole container, just to my little uh, farm here. I could do this at the organizational unit level if I wanted to keep everybody in the OU, but my little lab will just do it right here, uh, just in the whole container. All right, so for the name in here, it was SSO agent. Okay, that's in, because that's what I named the enrollment agent. And then I need to, uh, See, let the following objects. So I want to manage just the user object, right? So that's kind of what I'm going through here. This is all in the documentation. Like I said, if you follow through, actually, the knowledge base for this. But I'm going to go down and do just the user objects because that's all I really want this being able to manage on. And then um, uh, let's see. I'll check uh, oh, property uh, property specific here. I can talk. And then this is. Um, this is a huge list that I need to find two specific properties um, that I'm kind of getting down to. It's that read, write, alt security entities. All right, so let's see. I know they're in here somewhere. Like I said, it's a massive list. I wish they had like a search or something, right? There we go. Read, alt security identities. I'll do read, write, and then finish. Okay. So that part's done uh, for that user. And then what I'm gonna do next, let's see, all right, just kind of going through the notes here, is, um, oh yeah, the NL agent user, right? Remember this one has to have those kind of two diametrically opposing roles. So the first thing I'm gonna do is make it a member of the remote desktop users group on my domain. Um, there we go. That way it can, uh, like I said, Log in on behalf of my users. It won't actually log in. It's going to do it on behalf of them. It'll inject the smart card that that's done. And then because I don't want people um, or somebody to actually be able to log in with this user, I don't want it actually logging in interactively. I'm going to go into group policy here, set group to um, to deny logon through remote desktop services. So go ahead and create a GPO. I'll call that one RAS SAML. And then I'll go ahead and link it here and then um, edit. And then let's see. So I'm just looking to see where this one is. Policies, and then it's under, I think it's under Windows settings. Yep. Pull this out a little bit so I can. Security settings, local policies, user right assignments, and then here somewhere I'll see deny access. Deny log on through, there it is. Um, then I log on through remote desktop services. So yes, I wanted to find this. Um, it's kind of a backwards one. Yeah, deny all login. Yes, and here's my user, my NLE user. So that's done. 
All right, so now they've got kind of both roles that are set in place. Okay, now I'm gonna configure the uh, certificate authority templates. So to do that, you go ahead and launch uh, the MMC, Microsoft console here. All right, and then we'll um, add, remove a snap in. And then what I wanna add is the certificate templates. So that's what I'm gonna be managing. Okay, so it's good. Let's go into certificate templates. And then I'm going to create the enrollment agent template. So I'll click on the enrollment agent there. I want to duplicate this template, actually. That's the way you change it. So I've duplicated it, and then we'll give it um, a new name and everything. So, all right. So I'll go over to the general tab, and it's copy of an enrollment agent. Let me change that name, and it needs to be a PRLS enrollment agent. And that'll also fix the template name as well. There we go, enrollment agent. Validity period is two weeks, renewal is six weeks. Publish it in Active Directory, but don't check that box that says do not automatically enroll. Okay, that looks good. And then the next tab I'm going over is, let me go to the uh, cryptography tab. Yeah, okay, so go to the cryptography tab tab and then uh, requests you must use one of the following uh, providers it's determined by yeah that whole so i'm going to uncheck that one and that one and then go down to the microsoft strong cryptographic provider and i want to move this all the way to the top yeah so just check that one and make sure it's on the top <clears throat> okay let's look at my notes here i said there's a lot of steps to SAML, right and then I'm going to go to the security tab. And then here I'm going to add the enrollment agent user. Remember, we called that one SSO agent. So I'll check the names, click OK. And this guy has to have uh, read and enroll uh, permissions here. So I need to allow those two. All right. Yeah, that's it. So I'll go ahead and click OK. There we go. That one's done, and now I need to create the smart card logon certificate template. So back to my list here, and there's smart card logon. Right click, I need to duplicate the template. And then let's go to the general tab, and instead of copy of smart card logon, let's change that to parallels, PRLS, um, smart card, and then uh, validity period, smart card, um, Log on. There we go. And validity period one year, six weeks for the renewal. That's good. And um, that's it. Okay, so we can move over to the cryptography and then frequent. Um, let's use one of these, a request must use one of these following providers. And again, um, and the one I want to use here is the Microsoft Strong cryptographic provider, just like before, and I'll move this all the way up to the top, again, just like we did. And in the security tab, I need to add the uh, SSO agent, the enrollment user. So do that right there. And that one also needs, this time it needs, uh, yeah, read and enroll. And then I'll look back at the issuance requirements. Uh, the number of authorized signatures is one application policy, and for any purpose, uh, user certificate request agent. That's what I'd like for that one. Okay. And those settings are good, so I can go ahead and click apply and OK. All right, so now let's go ahead and issue the certificate templates. I could have done it one at a time, but I'm going to do them both. So back into MMC, and then I'll add and remove a snap in. And this time I'm going to actually add the certificate authority. So put that on here. And now I've got this tool going. And then I go into the demo one. Let everything catch up a minute. We're going to this. And then um, drill down to the certificate templates. And then I'm going to uh, create a new certificate template to issue. 
and I should be able to pick my two. So I'll start with a PRLS enrollment agent and click OK. That's in there. And then let's go ahead and um, let's do the other one. So right click in new certificate templates to issue. And I'll go down and get the other one, right? The um, PRLS smart card log on. So there they are. They're both there. So that's been done. I've issued both of them. So I can go ahead and close and get out of this. Okay, so now I want to restart the Active Directory Certificate Services. So I'm going to Manage and Services from the Server Manager here. And then, uh, let's see, I guess it's what, oh, Active Directory, so it's probably near the top, right? There we go. Let me expand that out just to make sure I'm getting the right one. Yep, Active Directory Certificate Services, and I'll go ahead and restart that. Okay, so it's time actually to go over to the RAS console and we'll set up an enrollment server. I actually have a server all ready to go, as you can see, so I don't have to Windows or anything for it. So just farm enrollment servers, click on the little blue plus, just like we do so many things. Um, exactly like that, I'll type in the name of the server as ESO1. Yep, I'll go ahead and go next. It's going to look for an agent, tell me it's not there. That's the timeout, right? Of course, it's not there. I haven't deployed it yet. So there it is. So since it's not there, I'll go ahead and install it. And it'll take a few minutes. Um, I'm actually going to speed this up real quick. So it's just going to zoom right on by for us so we don't have to wait. Okay, there we go. We'll get that done. Okay, so I'll go ahead and click on done. The agent says it's there. I'll go ahead and click on OK. And then um, we always click apply. So come back and tell me it's not validated yet because I haven't done the AD integration. So let's go ahead and do that. I'll go to the AD tab, certificate authority. This information is already in here for us. And then I want to add the enrollment agent, right? That's our SSO agent, right? The enrollment agent user. So I'll go ahead and uh, put that one in. And then the NLA user, well, hey, that's the NLA agent user. We, we go figure. So we'll look that one up, NLA agent. Browse through the domain. There we go. Okay, NLA agent user, and then I'll go ahead and put the uh, password in for that one. And if I click on validate, I get this error message. It's just a normal informational message. It takes a minute. I got to click apply first, of course, right? And then it takes a minute for this to sync up. So there's that invalid I was talking about. I just refresh it, and it should come back, and it's okay. And now if I go back into the AD integration and click on uh, validate, right, we're all good, perfect. Okay, so uh, now let's go back to Active Directory. This is again my local AD, if you will, not the Azure AD. And I'm gonna go to that um, GPO that I created earlier, Raz SAML, that would deny log on to the NLA agent user. And what I wanna do is, I'm just gonna go ahead and add the, um, Select computers here, make sure it's looking to the right object. I'm going to add my remote application server. I just have one in my farm for a demo here. I'm going to add that to this. I could actually do this all through an organizational unit and link it that way, but uh, for here, I'm just going to do this and then I'm going to make sure that's enforced so that that's. Okay, so let's go back to the RAS console. I'm going to configure the integration with our identity provider, which is Azure. So connection, SAML, with a little blue plus. Um, I'm going to go ahead and give it a name. I'll just call it RAS SAML. Remember, SAML uses HTML5 only, so I can pick a theme that I want this to apply to. I'll just use the default theme because that's all I have in the lab, but I could pick any theme that I created. And now I need to um, copy the address over here. So let me go back over to Azure AD, and actually we need to create SAMLs. So I'll go into Active Directory on Azure. This is the Azure side, of course. And I'm going to create a new enterprise application. We've got a bunch of them running already in our environment, but I'm going to create a new application. And it's a non-gallery app. And the name I'll give it, um, let's see, how about just Raz? Lab certification. There we go. I'll go ahead and add. Up in just a second. There we go. And then I'm going to assign the users and groups. That's done. And I'm going to set up single sign on. So let's do the single sign on. And we're choosing SAML here, of course. 
and then let's just kind of work our way through. So um, right here, you'll see the, uh, the Federation URL. Let's go ahead and copy that. Usually we can just copy and paste this in and I'll go back to that screen that I left up inside um, Res and do that. Paste it, click next and yeah, that didn't work. Okay, sometimes that happens. I think we're still kind of figuring that out. It's not a big deal if it does. Um, it'll time out here. What I'll need to do though is go back over to Azure and download the uh, federated uh, metadata XML. So let me download that and then I can just import it in. And this will work. I'm not sure what's going on with a copy paste. Like I said, I think that's still something that's being massaged a little bit. So let me choose here the upload from the file and then let me browse over and find where I downloaded that file, right? Bouncing back and forth between RDP windows and virtual windows and all that. It's always fun. <coughs> okay, there it is. That's where you put it. So you put that in there, click open, and then I'll click next and see uh, that work. So here we are. And I've got my log on and log out URLs um, right there. So click finish. Why? Okay. And then I'll go into the properties and then let's click on that SP. This is the Azure uh, load balancer address that I'm going to put in here. The reason it's the Azure load balancer address is that's the one that was already configured. So we'll just use that because that's what people are doing. So let me go ahead and put that IP in there. And then it fills out a string of URLs for me. I'm going to need each of those and I can copy them each in turn. So I'll copy the first one and then I'll go into the re uh, RAS, the SAML configuration here and I'll paste the identity provider uh, identity entity ID in here that I got from the console in RAS. That's there. Okay. And then I'll go back over to my uh, environment. I'll get the apply URL and I'll go ahead and paste that there. All right. And the next would be the logon URL, which I'll get and I'll paste it here. The relay state URL, by the way, actually but we usually just paste the uh, the sign on in there as, as well. So you can just do that twice if you'd like. And then for the logout URL, I will put that in the logout URL. Imagine that, right? I love it when things match up. Okay, so that part's done. And I'll click save. And then while that's going on, we'll see that now the URLs match the RAS settings. Okay, so next I want to go into the user attributes and claims and pick a claim name. I mean, you could select for the type of login you want. I think most people would just prefer to use the email address. So that's what we'll do. If you look at the knowledge base article that we have here, actually what I want to copy is the user principal name, not the user mail name. I'm not sure why, but the developers do and it's in the, or, and it's in the uh, KB article. So I'll go back over here to the RAS console, go to attributes and custom, and then for mail, I'll take out that little email in the custom attribute, and I'm going to plug in that user principal name. And then uh, go ahead and click OK. We always click apply, right? OK, within that, let's go back to my local Active Directory, the non-Azure Active Directory, and I need to create some users. Remember, it's a remote desktop server. It's joined to the domain. Every user, even if it's coming from a foreign directory, I guess, like this is, it has to be unique uh, for this to really work all the way through. If I just had a single dummy user that was logging in all over the place, then every single user would be logging into the remote desktop server with the same user, and that would be a mess, right? Get the same profile and everything. One user to one account, even though I'm passing it through. So I'll just create a test user. I don't have to worry about the password here so much. I can create just a random password that never expires because remember, we're actually going to be injecting a smart card, a virtual smart card here for the login. So that'll be my test user. I'd have to do this for every user that I have. And then the way I associate it though, is I go into the attributes and add the, my Azure AD email here, right? Not anything to do with domain at all, but my Azure AD email in there. That'll create the hook that ties this in together. Okay, one last little thing to clean up here. Those of you that were eagle-eyed might have noticed that I skipped the very first step when I set up the uh, SAML on Azure, and that was the head group and add the assignment. 
Uh, what I need to do here actually is take my Azure AD users. And I'm going to use admin uh, for one, and then I'll grab my uh, EDI desktop, even though this is a remote desktop, the users are in that group. And what I'm doing is I'm granting these Azure user accounts permission to use the sample app. So don't forget that step, right? So I'm doing that here and I'm clicking assign and you can see that now I've added both those to the group or both groups to the permissions. And if I look in this one group and look at the members, you'll see the email address I used matches this one. So it is a member of the group. So it works all the way through and it does the handoff and everything else and it should work. All right, so let's find out, moment of truth. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'll reinitiate the login to the web page here. And notice it gives me a, not a RAS logon, but ultimately I'm gonna get the SAML logon, right? That we've been seeing. So that should be kind of familiar to the users in that regard. Go ahead and type the password and log in. And again, this is the password for that Azure AD email account. Nothing to do with anything we've created in your quote, local AD or in uh, RAS. So I'll go ahead and sign in and there's my app. I have just published a, a desktop off the terminal servers all we did. I could use the Parallels client integrated here, but I'm actually gonna, let's just launch this in HTML5 only because that's always kind of cool. I always kind of like this interface. And when you go full screen, you really can't even tell that you're running in a tab in the browser, right? I see the Parallels logo and that tells me success. So, hey, we did it, Woohoo! All right, and yeah, you can see I can move around and use this just like a regular desktop, right? We're successful, we've logged in, like I said, woohoo. So let's break out of this and we'll look back at the RAS console and I'm gonna show you who actually logged in, farm, already session host. And then we we'll go to sessions and look at that, you can see that it actually is that test user, it has nothing to do with that. So you might actually wanna name this something that's a little bit more useful than test user. I did it just so we could see. So very easy, very easy to set up. Huh? Super simple, not complex at all. <laughs> if only. It's just the nature of SAML. So to be honest, the first time we recorded this, we got an error and I had to go back to the magic of video and connect but, or fix it. But this is what we got. We logged in. I want to show you kind of what happened so you can get an idea about how to uh, things that can go wrong here. Um, so let's go back in time. So we logged in, we did this, and then we kind of went through the single sign-on piece. We got this far to the desktop. And then when we launched the desktop right, through HTML5, uh, uh, Denied. Why is this denied? And you got to think, okay, is it certificates? Is it something I did in group policy? No, this was super simple. We had forgot to add that um, NLA agent user to the remote desktop users group. Don't forget the basics. You just It's the basics right there. That was what happened. So now if I go back and do it, I don't have to log out and back on. This is taking part inside uh, the local Active Directory. Okay. So very easy to kind of miss a step. It's just the nature of SAML. We've got it all documented very closely. There's knowledge base articles for both Okta and Azure that take you pretty far into those identity providers, how to do this. Um, so those are there. And we've also got some other knowledge base articles as well. Other identity work. So it's not just limited to those two. Those are just the two that we have documentation on currently. A couple of quick tips I've seen um, with SAML is don't forget that it's, it requires HTML5 as your authentication, right? I can't use the client uh, directly. I have to use the HTML5 interface for the login because SAML is a web-based application. Now, I can use the client and take full advantage of that, but I just have to use the HTML5 integrated client. We saw earlier. Remember, we, uh, when I logged in, we did the right click and there was the option to use the client or the HTML5 only, but the interface that the user is presented with is, um, is the HTML5 interface and it's tied to themes. So you actually could have a SAML theme and a non-SAML theme if you wanted to. And the client does have to be version 17.1 or later. The other one I see, which is very related to this, is sometimes people will see that Parallels client-based SSO that has nothing to do with SAML, right? They see kind of this interface, single sign-on, SAML talks about single sign-on, same thing. Well, first of all, you shouldn't be using the client. Remember, SAML is uh, HTML5 only. It's a web application. But this is just the client piece. If you install single sign-on using the Parallels client directly, it's it just uses the local Active Directory, whatever the client is joined to, it will pass those credentials into RAS. That's what that is for. 
has nothing whatsoever to do with SAML. So just don't get confused there. Okay, and then the last little tidbit is, you notice we're doing this with RDSH. That's what's currently supported. According to the documentation, BDI with SAML and RAS is limited. I'm not sure exactly uh, what limited is by, uh, but it's what's in the documentation. I do know that we will be adding in VDI support in the not too distant future. But other than that, um, that's it for SAML. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the logs and uh, some of the troubleshooting techniques that we go through, as well as some of the tools that are available to us as well within RAS. Um, so I want to start with kind of an introduction to the logging system within RAS, and then I'm going to show you some examples of how we use the logs to uh, troubleshoot and resolve some issues. I want to talk about resolving some compatibility issues, uh, specifically using a tool called uh, Remote App, which actually is from Microsoft. Uh, it's a shell. I'll talk about shells in a minute. And then we'll look at the auditing and revert settings, uh, a little bit of information in server tools on those categories and how that works. And we'll also do a little demo of some of this as well. But to start, let's just take a look at logging, right? I think most of you guys are probably all familiar with this, but you can look at the logging settings under farm and then go down to the settings. Um, item under there and then go to global logging. From here, it lists kind of the standard logs that are available. And you can select a single log or multiple logs and then we perform an action on top of it. So select the log that you want, like here I'm gonna grab my two PAs and I'll click configure logging on them. And I can choose the level of logging that I want. Standard is on by default, but you can add extended and verbose logging. Some of the logs I'm going to show you, I'm going to list kind of what all the logs are. You can see what they kind of tie to are only going to exist if you've got extended logging on. That's just the only way to work. Uh, verbose logging, that gets pretty uh, aggressive. At that point, you're probably looking at like engineering type data that would be more useful for the uh, development team than anything. Uh, extended and verbose in particular have a, a performance impact on your servers, right? They're aggressively logging. It's just going to it's going to take up some cycles. That's just the nature of logging. One of the cool things, though, is you actually can set a time to how long you can run that um, verbose or extended logging on. Standard logging is just on by default, 24 7, 365. But extended or verbose, you can say, okay, it's been happening sometime within this certain time period. Let's turn that on. That also can be useful because you can see the clear button up there, right? Uh, clearing the logs, you can start fresh. These logs can get kind of long and trying to dig through and read all this very uh, dry data uh, can be a little tedious and difficult to figure out. So if you're kind of in a troubleshooting situation that you at least know somewhat duplicatable, um, or at least you know it'll happen before too long, you probably can back up your logs, clear them, and then turn on extended or verse logging for a period of time, let it happen again, and then you can go and retrieve them. Uh, you can retrieve them here. It kind of puts it up in a nice neat zip file for you and lets you save them where you want. Uh, but that's kind of the high level there. Uh, if we look at the log specifically, the main one really is the controller log that's associated with the publishing agent. You can see the publishing agent, just in case anybody doesn't remember, is really the central piece. It's the controller, uh, the connection broker, if you will. It handles a lot of the a lot of the main uh, activity that goes on authenticates with Active Directory, second level authentication is there, a lot of notification of devices and updates. Um, you can distribute the settings and information out to the remote agents, management of the RDP session information, the app information, uh, orchestrate a lot of these different uh, pieces and parts. It's kind of the core piece. So it's usually a good place to start when you're looking at the logs. Again, these are the logs that are generally or that are associated with the publishing agent. You might, again, not see all of these on your system if you're kind of following along, unless you turn on extended logging. But the controller log is really the first place I usually go, unless it's obvious that maybe I should go somewhere else. But um, the controller log really is going to have a lot of that information in it uh, that you want for troubleshooting. The installer logs, uh, there's really two types. There's the uh, installation and then the setup logs. The installation, uh, you know, this is really, did it run? 
right? Th these are used also, by the way, when we're pushing agents to other servers. We usually would push the RAS installer. It's going to run it locally over there. That information can be captured in the installation log files, but mostly it's going to tell us, did the, uh, did the installer run? Did it finish? Did it complete? As opposed to, did it crash partway through? If you want to get down into the details of what happened, that's when you start looking at the setup log, right? That can be useful if you actually run through the setup itself, but also the, again, when you're pushing an agent out, it will run through an actual setup process kind of silently, so we don't have to see it, right? We just see the little status bar in the RAS console, but that information is being captured in the setup logs. The RDSH agent logs, there's a lot of them here. Oh, and by the way, um, all these logs are stored in the program data directory under parallels and then RAS logs. So if you don't necessarily just retrieve all logs, if you just like to run to them directly very quick, usually that program data is at the root of the C drive, right? So it's C colon backslash program data, but I guess it's a system variable, so it could be anywhere. Program data is usually a hidden folder, by the way. So you have to turn on hidden files and folders to see that. Um, these are the ones that are associated with the terminal server agent. Again, TS agent is always there. Some of the others may or may not be. I'm not going to read through all the logs. You're going to have access to these um, slides. I just wanted to list them here so you would be able to see them. I don't think this information is in the admin guide. Next up would be the server logs, uh, you know, for the gateway VDI agent enrollment agent, right? We have a new enrollment agent server or enrollment server rather. These are the ones that are typically or that are associated with these. And then don't forget, too, that there's client side logging as well. The easiest way to get that from a Windows client is you just go to the Parallels client directly, internal tools and options, and then you can view log, right? You also can enable extended logging in the client as well, um, which will do uh, the extended logging piece, right? You get a little bit more information there. So don't forget there's client logs. They also have logging on other devices as well. This is where you would go find it on the Mac client, right? You go into the Parallels client, preferences, general tab, and then logging. You can view log, clear log, enable extended logging, and so forth. Um, we do have logs on some other clients as well, and this kind of lists some of the uh, logs that are associated with those. Again, I'm not planning on reading all of these. I just want them to be here so that when you have access to the slides, if you're having trouble sleeping at night, you can look through here and remember all of these, right? I'm sure a question like this would be on the test. Boy, I sure hope not. I haven't seen the test yet, so I don't know. <laughs> I wouldn't think it would be, though. Um, other logs, uh, the PC agent, guest agent logs, these are logs that can be associated with them, like I said, if you have um, extended logging turned on. Okay, that's enough of these eye charts. Let's look at some real-world examples. I'm going to show you a couple of different logging examples where we kind of had to dig through the logs to figure out what was going on. So the first issue is we had a client connectivity failure, right? The end user was actually connecting through a tenant broker. They would log in successfully. They would see the applications that were published, but then when they launched an application, it would fail. And they get kind of this warning or this message, right? The connection was ended because of a network error. Okay. They're like, well, my network's up. I can, you know, got everything all the way through. What's going on here? Right? That could be anything. What do you mean a network error? Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at the logs and see if we can get better information about what's going on. So if we look at the controller log, we kind of pulled it up. Unfortunately, we didn't have to parse through a whole lot of data here. And if we read down through the controller log, I can see that, you know, I was just testing it with the admin. It hadn't been rolled out in production yet. So admin at vCloud was logging on. It was successful. And then, hey, look at that. Look at this piece, right? wants to launch application number two, remember all the applications programmatically have a number associated with it. That's how we kind of keep track of it. And it went to the server and 3389 was the port is unavailable. That's interesting. Okay. It's having trouble making an RDP connection to the server is kind of how I review this. And that would be, remember where we make the RDP connection to the server? Let's keep in mind where that is. Right, we're coming in and out of the load balancer off port 80 or 443, right? And that means we're going into the secure client gateway off port 80 or 443. And 3389 would exist only between the gateway and the remote desktop server, I guess, for the VDI instance, if you're doing that, or even a remote PC. This was a terminal server, so RDSH. 
So it's something between the gateway and the terminal server where the port is failing. Add in the factor, that remember this is a tenant broker, so it's kind of new, and you're thinking, okay, is this something going on with the tenant broker that's causing a problem? And you kind of step back and you look at the architecture of a tenant broker. Well, let's get back to fundamentals. Just because we added more icons in here, and more pieces and parts, doesn't mean that the fundamentals change. I'm still making an RDP connection from port 3389 on a gateway to my remote resource, the remote desktop server, VDI, PC, or whatever. So I'm still making that connection. So that's the piece that's failing. And what happened was he'd forgotten to open up the port on the firewall on that tenant, right? You gotta have 3389 open on that internal firewall. This should be an internal firewall, not a public facing firewall, by the way, just in case you're wondering, the public facing firewalls should be in front of the uh, tenant broker gateways, not here. So this is just an internal. So you'd need to have 3389 open, he forgot to open it. He could have used a different port too and just made sure that he specified in the gateway, the terminal server and the firewall, all that would have to link up if he used like 3390 or something like that. But the default of course is 3389. So that kind of helped us figure out what was going on with that, right? Okay, it was the something with the RDP port and then you got to think about where that goes. All right, let's take another one. This one actually happened to me personally. Uh, the Parallels client was working fine if I just use it directly, but when I was using the HTML5 interface, it would randomly fail. And I'd get this error. And this actually is the same error that we saw um, when we did the SAML test, right? You made a typo in the, uh, the HTML5 forwarding, and that would cause this problem, but I hadn't done that, right? It was still at the defaults. It's an internal lab. I wasn't going through anything too funky, but I was getting this where sometimes it would work and sometimes it wouldn't. And the agents all reported okay in the console. So I took a little bit of a shortcut on this one. I actually grabbed that uh, error at the bottom. 404 not found. It's not helpful, but RAS secure client gateway HTTP forwarding is disabled. And I plugged that into our online knowledge base. And what do you know? I came up with a knowledge base article. So I go to the knowledge base article and see what's going on. And it says, oh, well, you got this component called node.exe and it should be uh, running in task manager and present on the server. Okay. So I went and took a look and looked at both my gateways. Gateway one was fine. But gateway two, guess what? Node.exe wasn't running on my secondary gateway. Right? So that explains the randomness, right? It's running on one gateway, but not the other. The help is Ron Robbins, so sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. And that node.exe only affects the HTML5 interface, which explains why the client would work, but HTML5 wouldn't. So to do a quick fix, I simply just ran a repair on the affected system. I ran the RAS installer, it popped up, it gave me the option to do repair. And by the way, you don't have to hunt around to find that RAS installer, we copy it uh, to a target, right? This was a Gateway 2, I pushed the, uh, the Gateway 2, and so it put the RAS installer on the local, on that uh, secondary gateway, and then and it ran it from there, so it wasn't enough to push all that data across the uh, network. And so I just went into C program files, x86 parallels, application server on my target system, and there's the installer. I run that, run a repair, and it fixed the issue. Okay, so that worked, but what the heck happened, right? Why, why did that fail? What was going on? So maybe if I went into the logs, I could get a little bit more information about what, what kind of was happening there. So let's go to the logs, right? If we got the HTML5 interface randomly fail, well, maybe it's the gateway. So a good place to start would be the gateway log. So I look in the gateway log, I start kind of perusing through that, and I find this section here, fail to create the process, node.exe, and then I look through there and it's got the JS file didn't work, uh, cannot find the file specified. Effectively, it's telling me that node.xd isn't on the server and that's why it failed. Well, okay, I already knew that, right? So the gateway is telling me what I already knew. So the next step I go over, and maybe it was something to do with the installation process. So I take a look at that MS, the RAS MSI log, try to look through that. And that also really didn't have a whole lot of information because the installer ran completed successfully, it didn't crash. That's really what that's looking at. And I know the gateway's up because like I said, it was reporting up in the, uh, in the dashboard. And also I was able to make connections through the RAS client, which this is one piece node.exe. So let's dig a little bit deeper. And I went to the setup CA.log. Remember this is the log that actually 
what goes on during the setup process. And I start looking there and I see something about node.exe and access is denied. So something was preventing that from going on, right? And that's telling me, so I've got something kind of wonky on that server that was interfering with the setup process and it could be interfering with something else. Typically when we see something like that, it's a permissions issue on the target server. Remember, the gateways don't necessarily have to be a member of the domain. Perhaps the account that you use because it prompts you to type in didn't have all the permissions you thought it did or they got changed or something. Another one might be that antivirus is interfering with the install. If you've got really aggressive antivirus, you might need to create some exclusions. The exclusions are listed in our best practice document. Um, in my case, actually, it was just a little bug that we've identified where sometimes it kind of fails, but it was kind of giving me a big head scratcher. I submitted that over to the development team to fix it. But most likely, if you see something like that, like I said, it would come back to permissions or antivirus. Or as I said, in this case, if you turn out, you know, you get to that knowledge base article and you see that node.exe is running, as we saw earlier, you can get that same error because you made a typo in the web redirection page, right? Under uh, farm and um, gateways and Okay, so that's a couple of examples of how you might dig through the logs and an introduction to the logs themselves. Another common one, well, it's not too common, but something that can happen is an application, excuse me, you'll publish an application and the app will launch, but it just won't display correctly, right? It just doesn't look right. Other times the app will fail to launch, it starts to launch and just and it's just one particular app, right? For other apps launch, maybe you launch like a test app and that launch is perfect from the server, but it's just this one application I can't get to launch. Or the other one that I've seen sometimes happen is you publish just an app, you launch the app and it breaks out of the app and suddenly you're looking at the full desktop, which is not what you're going for. You just kind of wanted to do the app. What often can cause this is a shell issue. And what's a shell? Just in case you don't know, well, you know, an app has to kind of run inside of something, right? You know, you're saying, well, it's running in Windows. Yeah, I know, but the display piece, it has to run inside of something. The default shell that we all know and love is, right, the Windows shell, it's the Explorer shell. You get the full desktop, apps run in that, it's their native habitat. However, when we're doing remote applications and publishing applications, you need to replace that Windows shell with something else. You gotta have a different shell because we don't want them to have the full desktop. And Parallels can take advantage of two different shells. Our native shell is called Memshell. So if you don't do anything and just publish applications, you're using Memshell, that's ours. You also might have heard of Remote App. Remote App, of course, Microsoft uses for a bunch of different things, including products, but Remote App also is a shell. It's a Microsoft application only shell. It's the shell that Microsoft uses to um, put their applications in when you use just the basic Microsoft native tools to publish applications. Well, Parallels can take advantage of either of these, right? And it's a big advantage because sometimes an app will work with one and not the other. The vast majority of applications out there will work with either one. It really makes no difference and it works and just goes fine. But some applications prefer Parallels Memshell and other applications prefer Microsoft's remote app. And I'll show you where the setting is when we kind of do a demo. I'll show you a quick picture and then do, the, do a quick demo on that as well. But, and so it's kind of more of an art almost than a science about which one you should use, right? Um, because the, as, as, um, the little failures up there I was talking about at the top, I've seen happen both ways. And I have also seen this. I had a couple of customers get really lucky. They were having an application fail with Parallels Memshell, so they turned on Remote App, and then Remote App fixed that application, but then they had another application fail. So one was compatible with Memshell, and one was compatible with Remote App. Well, um, this actually can be set for servers. So the solution here was simply, he had to break those, that, those two applications onto two different remote desktop servers. Doesn't change your Parallels licensing, by the way. Remember, everything's included. And he would set one server to use remote app and one to use uh, memshell and that would fix it. Uh, like I said, um, you know, that third bullet I kind of skipped over there, remote app only works with Windows clients. That's one thing to kind of keep in mind. It's a Windows construct and that's a limitation of that. 
So remote app, if you have Windows clients and something works with remote app, it'll work. But otherwise, um, if you're using a non-Windows app, you're, you're going to have to use Memshell. It's the only way, right? So if you're using HTML5 only, not the HTML5 integrated with a client, but HTML5 only, you're using Memshell. If you're running off a of Mac, a Chromebook, iOS, Android, anything like that, Linux, you're using Memshell. If you're running off of a Windows client, you might be able to use either one, uh, depending on the setting that you set. So where's the setting? Um, you know, by the way, if the apps still don't launch correctly, um, it's just the app is just not going to let itself be stuffed into a shell. It's not going to do it. And that's when you're kind of looking at uh, you're going to have to go to the full desktop or VDI or something like that. There's a few other tricks that you can kind of fight with in there, like uh, some JavaScript apps have um, some issues with, uh, I think there's a setting about icons or something under advanced settings. There's a knowledge base article on that if you just go type Java sets, um, Java apps. but you know, and support is very talented at getting other apps to work. But this is a quick one that you can try very, very fast. Just change that setting, log off, log back on, and see what happens. So it's just a really quick one that you can do instead of uh, um, kind of having to go outside to deal with it. But support is pretty talented, like I said, at getting uh, some other application issues out. So to look where to set that, you just go to Farm, RD Session Hosts, uh, select an RD Session Host, and go to Properties. Again, there's that group defaults, inherit default settings. You can set this server by server, or you can set them on all of them. And then there's a checkbox under agent settings tab. So go to that agent settings tab. It says use remote app if available. It's off by default. And again, the if available is because if it's a non-Windows client, it won't be able to use a remote app, and it will default and fail back to um, Memshell. So even if you turn it on and you're connecting from a Mac, uh, it won't just shut it down or go into the ether. It'll launch it using Memshell, which may or may not be working for you, just depending on how things go. But that's that's kind of what's happening there, just in case. Uh, the other thing, I'll show you this too when I do a quick uh, demo of this, is there's a um, overlay icon you may have noticed, right? So the Memshell overlay icon is the standard parallels icon, which you can change in themes if you like. But it's a little uh, parallels double hot dog logo down there. Remote app has their own icon, which is put in place. And you can see it's this kind of arrows pointing at each other off center a little bit. That's the Microsoft remote app icon. So if you walk into somebody's environment and you look at their app that they've launched with the parallels client, just looking at the icon, if it's got that remote app icon, you know they've turned remote app on for some reason or other. Again, obviously, this is only on Windows clients that this works. Okay, with all that, why don't we jump over to um, to a server side and let's do um, an actual demo and take a look at some of this a little closer. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, some of the interface and the tools that we have in action here. So I'm going to go ahead and log into the Parallels console. And here we are. So let's deal with the remote app first, the remote app settings. So if you go to farm and then RD session hosts, and then I've got a few different RD session hosts here. Let's just pick on these two. I'm going to take the second one. I'm going to right click and go to properties. Agent settings. I'm going to have this one not set to inherit the defaults. That way we can uh, modify it independently of another one. And then right here is the checkbox, use remote app if available. Go ahead and click that. And now this server will be using remote app. And if we look at number one, my first server up here, agent settings, it has remote app off. So it's just going to use Memshell exclusively. So let's go publish a couple of applications and we can look at the difference. So I'll go to publishing, I'll go to add. Application, already session host, I'll choose installed applications. Next, and for individual servers, I'm going to choose number one. This is the one without remote app. Next, click Windows inventory list and, oh, let's grab calculator, right? So I'll go next, next, and finish. We'll go back and I'm going to publish calculator again, only this time I'll use the other server. So next, party session host, installed applications, next. 
And this time we'll pick the remote app server next. And go to calculator next and next finish. And then for this one, right, it's easy to get confused. Let me make sure this is the correct one. So from publish from, now I'm going to number two, which is the remote app. So under the application tab, I'll give it um, a name, remote app, calculator. Now we'll kind of be able to tell. And then we always click apply. Okay, so with that, let's go ahead and log in like an end user. Just go into the admin, uh, the web interface, and I'll log in. Okay, and you can see the two apps, the remote app calculator and the calculator. So if I just double click on the regular calculator, and there we go, calculator. You can see and it's got the parallels little logo on it. And now I'll go to remote app calculator. And we can see the difference. Now it's actually taking a little bit to log in again, right? Because it's having to create a session on the other server. Uh, since I've got remote app and non-remote app, it's forcing me to two different servers. It can't keep the session open on the same server. So now I have the other one open. So minimize. We have calculator, calculator, and you can see the remote app logo. Right. It's got that little uh, logo down there, and then here's the Parallels logo up here. That's really all it is, and from a functional standpoint, it looks kind of the same to me, right? Um, what's the difference? Well, in an app like Calculator and most apps, nothing. But if your app isn't displaying right or anything like that, that remote app setting can be very, very useful. Okay, so let's go back auditing and logging functions. So for those, I'm going to go back under farm and then I'll go down to settings and let's deal with uh, global logging first. Right, and this is exactly what we saw. I can select multiple items here if I want and then to configure logging, uh, standard extended remote for both uh, and I can set the time here, right? Nothing too too crazy here and then I can always retrieve them. And again, that puts it in this nice little zip file for me that I can stick wherever I want. Okay, a couple other settings that might be uh, kind of useful we can look at. One is back under auditing. You actually have the ability to audit all these uh, settings and processes right um, here. So as changes are made to any of these things that affect uh, these particular things, they're going to get audited or logged. And I can add more up here if I want with a little blue plus, right? I can add another process and put it in here if I'd like. So auditing by default is disabled. So you have to come here and turn it on. I enabled it just so we can kind of see something and then I can do and view audit. There's not going to be too much in here, but you can see, you know, playing with a few things kind of going on. And it'll also show you, you know, if you really look at it, who did it. And of course, I log on mostly as the administrator. Uh, it's probably a good best practice to not just do that, have everybody use their own individual accounts if you're going to do auditing. Then you can see who changed what. But I can also see the users as well. So that's the auditing function. Beyond that, one other setting I'm here uh, that people kind of don't think about necessarily or realize was added is under client settings. So I'm under farm settings, client settings. I can show a password expiration reminder, right? So the end users log in, they get that, uh, hey, your password's expiring, you might want to change it. Because remember, if I'm working out of a system like this, uh, just inside the web interface, even with it without the console, how am I going to change my password, right? How do I even know it does? This will be a reminder that pops up. And then this little user icon up here, I can click on that. There's a change password. So that's how a user actually can change passwords. You can do that from the client as well. One of the little tip here that I don't know if too many people is little settings. I don't come across this very often, but the settings are kind of held in little cookies. So as long as you allow uh, cookies on the local uh, workstation, it'll remember these. But you can turn this on or off. The big one, 
and I haven't seen this in a while because we've made so many improvements to the HTML client, but every so often there'll be a wonky application where keyboard just doesn't work right. I've seen this where it's like got a, uh, it was a big EMR app that it had a hard coded uh, field and it just wasn't recognizing the numbers. It, it would only take numerical values, nothing else. They could kind of click in it and use the up and down arrow to toggle the numbers, but they couldn't actually type the number in there. We switched it to PC keyboard and it lit up and it worked. Uh, the default universal keyboard, which is better. Again, the HTML5 client has been improved so much that you probably, I haven't had to do this in a long, long, long time, like years. Uh, but just so you know, that's there if you need to do it. And there's some other settings as well. The other thing too, don't forget to configure as we go through this is notifications. I can sub, come in here and click on the blue plus and then I can add all sorts of notifications. This will notify an administrator um, specifically under the email. If you've configured the email server functionality within um, administration, you know, to integrate with your mail server and then put in the email address of administrators. They can get notifications about what happens. You also can write little scripts that also will tell you um, what's going on there. Okay, so let's move off this one. These were just simple little things, but here's a feature that I'm not sure too many people are aware of. If I go down to the administ uh, administration icon and then the settings audit, I can see the changes that were made and I actually have the ability to revert some of them. So what do I mean by that? I can go up here to publishing and I can delete, um, let's delete the remote app calculator. And while I'm at it, I'm also going to delete the regular calculator. So I click up a little bit and then I'm going to click apply. And I'm thinking to myself, oops, I didn't mean to delete the second calculator. And obviously a single app isn't a big deal, but if you've got larger settings, this could be a pain. And you're like, oh, now I've got to publish it again and do all that stuff. Well, I could just go to the administration tab, or excuse me, the administration icon category here. I can go to the settings on it. And when I refresh, I will see um, the delete, right, of calculator. And this is calculator, not the remote app calculator. So it lets me know that that happened. The other ones are essentially me clicking apply. So I could click on this and then I can go up under tasks up here in the top right. View the entry. That's what I would like to do. And then from here, I can see the actual changes that were made. You know, if I want to get into that level, but I also could just click revert and revert. Yep. I want to revert the changes and then um, apply. And then now if I go back to publishing, a calculator was restored, right? So very, very cool. And then again, that was under administration and uh, settings audit. A uh, couple other little features that we've added in here that may help you a little bit is under farm. And then if I click on site, you know, here's the dashboard that we all know and love that we've, we've done such a nice job on, right? You can see, but I can click on a server up here, any one of them, and then uh, click on tasks and under tools, we've added all these windows management tools for the server. I can RDP right to my server to deal with it from here instead of, oh, I need to go check that out. Let me launch an RDP window. And then what's that address again? I can just go, okay, let's, I need to go look at the server and log on. So you go to tools, remote desktop and do that. I can pull up the computer management, the services, look at the event viewer, um, PowerShell, ping the host, you know, that's that. I can even down from here. So those are some very nice handy shortcuts that we've integrated in the environment uh, for server management. And the last one I want to show you that can be of use is don't forget about this little information um, icon down here. Support uses this a lot. Um, it provides similar information to what's in the dashboard, but it does give us a little bit more, right? I can see these servers and I can see their status, of course, of the agent. CPU, memory, disk, read, and write, all that I've already got, but it kind of in place. But if I scroll down and look at a bit closer to it, 
um, I can see that the services start at this time and date, and that was also the last time that the operating system booted. So I can see how long it's up, and that if there's any uh, unhandled exceptions or anything like that kind of going on. And I can do that for all the components across my entire farm. And then if I move to some of them, like the gateways, I, I can get in some more information about it, like, uh, you know, the current client connections and SSL connections and things like that that are going on. On Why isn't this gateway being used, but the others are being pounded? You know, you could take a look at all, all sorts of information that's in here. So all this is very, very useful. I can even get down and see the on the RD session host. Some of this, of course, you can find in other screens, but other pieces, um, it kind of puts it up in a nice spot right here where you can kind of take a look at it. And we have more than earned another break at this point, so let's go ahead and take that. I'm going to put the timer up for about 15 minutes. Um, probably about another 45, 50 minutes when we're back. It won't go quite the full hour, I don't think. So you go ahead and put that timer up and um, hey, have a good break, everybody.
Okay, welcome back. Hope everybody had a good break. We're going to get into the last section here. I talked about some uh, additional features and functionality um, in version 17.1, update one. These are pretty cool features, actually, a lot of uh, interesting things. They just weren't quite big enough to warrant their own section, or at least long enough in terms of the time it takes to introduce them. So we're going to add them all right here. So what we're going to take CAD is actually one of the very cool features is Azure VDI and RDSH auto scaling. We've added that capability into Azure. We'll do a quick demo on that. Uh, same thing with Google Authenticator. I want to show you and introduce you to that functionality, and then we'll do, like I said, a demo as well. And the two other features that I think are very underutilized, I don't know if too many people are aware of them, but we kind of snuck them in, but administrative folders, and then I want to talk about some of the advanced publishing features and functionality that you can use and also how to delegate permissions. And then finally, we're gonna very quickly go over just a couple of uh, new features in version 17.1 that I just want to introduce them to you. Okay, so let's start with Microsoft Azure VDI RDSH provisioning or auto scaling, if you will. We've had this capabilities in our on-prem hypervisors, Hyper-V, vCenter, Tenex Acropolis scale, et cetera. We've had that for a while, and what we've done is extended this functionality uh, to Microsoft Azure version 17.1. So we have the ability to scale and manage workloads on demand now directly in Azure. So you can kind of scale up your VDI environment, scale it down, and the same thing with uh, the RDSH workloads. So you can auto-provision and auto-scale these. Again, it's a very similar mechanism to what we're doing with our on-prem capabilities, but it does have a few Azure-specific features and functionalities in them. Okay, so let's take a look at this in action. This is a uh, RAS environment, obviously, that's in my lab. And I want to show you how to initiate the connection with Azure. So just like you would normally do adding an on-prem hypervisor, you go to farm, VDI. You can see I've already got a couple of hypervisors in here already that are on-prem, vCenter, as well as uh, scale computing. So you can still mix and match. We don't tie you down to one. If you kind of migrate environment, end up in a hybrid, Kind of situation you can certainly do that and then just like normal i would go up here and click on the little blue plus in the top right and what's different is here instead of just having the virtualization for on-prem hypervisors which we support obviously very many of them then there's cloud computing new option when i go to next it takes me to the information page to continue on with this process the type is microsoft azure and it's grayed out why do we do it like that well we left it as cloud computing because obviously we're going to add more cloud providers as time goes by. Probably the next one we'll be adding will be AWS. I, I don't have a time frame on when that would happen right now, but Azure is currently supported. Okay, so this is what it looks like as you initiate it. What I want to do is switch over to um, a different environment where I've already got the Azure hypervisor configured for us. Okay, so this environment already has integration with the Azure hypervisor already completed. Um, everything we're doing, by the way, is in this knowledge base article that you guys can follow along with. But um, in this farm, I've got a tenant, and then I've joined it to the hypervisor up here using Azure. Okay, so let's go ahead and go into the properties of this. So we can review what was done. And you can see that I've given it a name. It has the authentication URL and the management uh, URL with it. And then two very important pieces, um, the tenant ID and the subscription ID. The subscription ID, you can have more than one subscription to Azure and integrate that if you'd like to. Uh, okay, and then we move on over to the credentials tab. And for the credentials, we're using the application ID and the application key. And that, if you don't know what that is, there's some Azure documentation where we have it in our own documentation to describe you about where to get that. But that's what allows us to integrate in and actually see the virtual machines running up in Azure and then start um, doing the cloning and templating process. So once this is done, I can actually see all the virtual machines running in the environment. I've got just a few running in our little lab, but I do have two Windows 10 images here, eight and nine, and they're being controlled by a template. They've already been deployed. So I'll go ahead and and look at the template settings here, right? You can see that it's ready, it's deployed, and it's, it's finished. So it's already finished uh, deploying them and it's be able to be used, of course, and published. But um, let's go ahead and take a look inside it. So I'll go up to tasks and then properties. 
And then here, you know, you can choose whether to delete an unused virtual machine, the max gas, the available buffer, and I can also give it a name, which I did to increment it. And then on the advanced settings, I can deploy about uh, the resource group. And then this is very cool, right? I can look at the VM size, standard A2, but you can pick actually the type of Azure virtual machine that you want to deploy to, including machines that use GPUs or eGPUs, right? So they're all available to us to deploy on. And then of course the hard disks as well, right? If I want to uh, choose solid state or just a HDD, both of those are available. And then for preparation, we use RASPREP still or SysPREP. They do the same thing. RASPREP's a little bit quicker because it doesn't require as many reboots. That's really the main difference between those two. And once this is all set, I can just click OK, apply, let it deploy. And then the, uh, the template now, the virtual machines, they're, they're ready to be published. And to do that, let me move back over to our other environment. So uh, to publish them, it's just like we always would do. There's nothing really that changed here. I go to publishing and down here and add. And then I can, let's just do a desktop since we're talking about BDI. I'll do next desktop next then I give it a name just like we've always done a specific template and then that would tie it into the RAS templates the other thing you can do you know, on Azure and our other hypervisors as well on-prem that we support I can do a remote desktop server so I could publish an application or a desktop off of those and that would allow us to auto scale these uh, the slick way to do this is just a little bit different I would go next I could just pick one um, or all servers in a site, but that doesn't really get me to the cool auto scaling features I want to show you. The way to do that is to create a group. So I would go to groups, pick a group. I've already created this group. I just called it uh, really auto scaling so we could show you here. And it's the group that ties the template to the application or the desktop that I'm publishing for remote desktop servers. So let me back out of this because I already have one created. And I'll just go up to farm and then already session hosts. And then inside the groups, this is where I do that. So um, you can see that I've got the auto scaling group created. And if I go to right, if I just um, go into the properties of this group, and here's where I would add the template, right? I would go and check on the RD session host based on a template like this, and it would show me um, the list of templates that I have available. And then as it deploys more virtual machines, it would show me actually what members are listed down here. And then the real magic is occurring under the template settings. Where here is where I can set the uh, the thresholds, right? Um, once it's setting a certain workload threshold, deploy another virtual machine, deploy another machine so I can scale up. And then I can drain an unassigned service from the group and it reaches below a certain percentage. This works in conjunction with that uh, delete unused VMs after a certain period of time so I can scale down, which is important in a cloud environment, right? I'm paying machines, it's not a sunk cost. So let's switch gears here. Good features in remote application server was the addition of uh, some integration with Google Authenticator. We actually added this back in version 17.0. Uh, this is a uh, a two-factor authentication service that's really easy to use. It's super simple. I'll show you that in demo. And of course, it's free. I really like free. Okay, so let's hop on over to a quick demo. This is really super simple to set up and use, and I'll show you that. So I've got a, a workstation right here, and I've got the Parallels client on one side, and then I've got an Android phone image up on the other, so I can show you the whole process. Just to show you things are working, I go ahead and log in normally, and there's my applications that I'm entitled to, right, that have been published. Click around all that. So let me go ahead and log off. And then we'll switch over to the RAS Administrator Console. And I'll go to uh, Connection and click on Multi Authentication and then the Provider. And you can see we've added Google Authenticator to the list. So it's there along with all the others. Always click Apply. That was hard. Okay, so let's back over to the client side. And now when I log in, right, it's gonna come up and it pops me up with a little barcode that I need to scan. So I'll just go over to my phone. I've already got the Authenticator app installed on it. I'll launch that and then we'll um, 
code in. Scan barcode, there we go. Take a picture of it. That's it, right? And then I just click OK. I've done this for the first time. It'll always remember now that this phone is attached to this uh, account, or the Google Authenticator account is attached to this. I'll type in that one time password, and I'm in. And there's my applications, right? And everything that I've got, I'll launch, oh, I don't know, WordPad, right? That one's always good. And WordPad will pop up here in a second. So that is really it. I mean, that's how super simple it is. Uh, since we're here, let me go ahead and close this off and then you can turn it off if you'd like, right? Let me get out of WordPad and I'll log off my client again. If you want to disable that, you can just switch back over to the administrator console. Yeah, that's because I closed out of the uh, WordPad. And connection, multi-factor authentication, back to none, apply. That's it. Okay, go back to my desktop again real quick. And yeah, there we go. Okay, so it works. Yeah, right? No multi-factor authentication. The reason I did that is let's go over and I want to show you how it works kind of on the uh, Android phone here. So let me log off here. And then I've also got the Parallels client on the Android phone. So I'll just log out. Yep, there it is. And I'll make a connection. You can see the phone. Phone actually is working as well on Android. This is the Android client, by the way, of course. So let's go ahead and turn on multi-factor authentication. So back to the RAS admin console, active connection, multi-factor authentication, Google Authenticator, click apply. Out of this, back to my phone, I'll launch the client from here. Now it's prompting me for my one-time password again, right? So I'll go back into Authenticator, open it up, and it's at 018223. Let's see if I can remember that. Back to the client, it's easier when it's on two screens. 018223, okay, there we go. There's my apps. Okay, so the basics are just really, really super simple as you saw, but I wanna show you a couple other quick things on the administrator side that you can do here since this is the advanced training after all, right? If I go up to uh, connection and then multi-factor authentication, I go down to Google Authenticator, just doing there's a settings button over here. Let's explore that a little bit. So if I click on settings, I can do a few things here. First of all, look at that. I can rename the type of authenticator I want from Google Authenticator. Why would I do that? is listed as Google Authenticator, but it actually works with any OTP provider out there. So if you're just using Microsoft's, uh, we've had support for Microsoft Azure in the radius setting for a while now, but you could use Microsoft's just OTP or anybody else, and then just change the name here from Google Authenticator to Microsoft OTP or whatever you're using, right? That's open like that, and it'll work. It, um, that keeps your end users from getting confused. Uh, you also can set an enrollment period so that it only works during this period of time. And then if you have a user that gets kind of um, messes something up or changes like that, you can reset them and they can, uh, they'll have to go through the little scan the barcode process again. And there's also ways to get in here and do some um, import users as well. So these are some things that you can dig into a little bit on it. The other thing I wanted to show you is that this interface is version 17.1 update one. So um, what it added is this right here, user or group exclude list, right? We've always had the ability to exclude, most people would do it off the client IP exclude list, but other ones exclude options as well. You know, you're at work, I don't challenge you for two-factor authentication. You're at home or Starbucks or something and I do but now I can also do it by group. So I can add a group in here. This group does not get challenged. So, um, you know, some people are working on something more sensitive and they need two factor. Other people perhaps aren't. It's just, you know, in the office work, whatever. Um, it's, you can exclude it by group also. Okay, and with that, we've wrapped up Google Authenticator. Okay, now I want to show you about a very cool feature that was introduced, I believe it was in version 17. Um, it, it's a stealth feature, <laughs> and I don't think it was very well documented or even advertised. 
it just kind of showed up in the interface, but it is really cool. It's been something I've been wanting for a long time. And it's under the publishing category, and it's the ability to actually create administrator folders, right? So let's say that your, uh, your environment is growing. It's been very successful in implementation. You're bringing more people on all the time, right? You're publishing more and more apps for different groups. And this list is not looking like mine in a little lab, but it's starting to get very long. And you got another problem too, you've been organizing it, right? And so when you log in, it's very well organized so far, but it's all in folders. And a lot of the end users are wanting to actually just have them presented uh, up here in the, the front. Now, I mean, they could come in here and star you know, applications that they use quite frequently and then access them right here kind of in a little favorites thing. Um, but they really would like to just, let me go ahead and clear that before I forget about it. But they really would like to uh, just log in and see them right here, right? Without having to go into any of the folders or anything like that. But yet that kind of breaks your organizational thing because you're probably doing filtering at the folder level, right? I mean, I'm not applying any filters here, but I could be, right? You're filtering at the folder level for all the applications that are underneath it instead of having to go you know, app by app by app. So what we can do actually is create administrator folders. So if I want to create a couple of different groups in here, I could create, um, you know, first of all, I can just right click and duplicate what I've already got. And in this one, I can just um, make this to, um, I don't want to sales apps. And then I'll just leave Microsoft Office. I'll call this um, you know, admin apps. Admins need Outlook, Word, and PowerPoint too, right? But for the admin apps, maybe I also want to create a special subfolder in here. And you, you can actually nest folders in here and call it domain apps. Or, or uh, yeah, we'll just call it domain apps. That'll work, right? And I can say use for administrator purposes and finish. And then I've got a couple of applications that an admin might want to use, such as I'd like to start publishing the remote application server console. And maybe they need to get into Active Directory users and computers. And then um, I'll go over here and I've already got it set for a folder tab for use for administrator purposes. And then up here at the admin level, under filtering, uh, this is going to be allowed only for, let's say, domain admins. That's the only people that need really to get into Active Directory users and computers, right? So domain admins, so that takes care of that. And then this other one, I've got, um, I call them, well, let's just, let's rename this. I'll call this um, productivity apps. And then I also want to drag the uh, mission critical, uh, let's call this, um, there we go. We'll call this mission critical sales apps, right? Calculator, WordPad, and uh, Paint, they need that. So I'll drag this under there and nest that. And I'll leave that in there so that they feel very, uh, sales users are important that they got their own folder, but for this folder, I'm going to use it for administrator purposes, and I'll go ahead and click apply. So now when I go back to my browser here, and this would work also through the client, if I refresh, see, get rid of that folder. So the folder up here is productivity apps. It's gone. I've actually got a folder here called productivity that has nothing in it. Let me get rid of that because that's confusing things. And apply. Right, and then I'll refresh again. That gets rid of app, get rid of that. I could reorder these a little bit, but now you can see that I've got my office apps right up here in the, the top row where I want to. And then if I log in, um, this person actually is a sales rep, and that's why they, they see the sales apps also. If I wanted to nest uh, that one, you know, I could come in here under productivity apps and mission critical sales apps, and I could make this folder for administrative purposes too, um, and then apply. I clicked apply, right, didn't I? Oh, I did. Yeah, I clicked apply. And then I just refresh, and then that goes away. And now they're all up here. So it's a way to kind of manage and manipulate. And then obviously, if I log in as um, 
break into this. I'll log in as an administrator for this one. Hopefully I didn't fat finger the password, right? Looks like it's good. I see the same set of things, except I also have my admin apps down here, which includes this. And obviously I did some duplication because I'm in a hurry uh, doing this. But that's what that administrator purposes folder is. It's a way where I can still apply filtering at the folder level without having to um, present it to the end users. Before, you, the only way to organize it was also to put all the apps and folders and users and we have you know, like a massive app at the top for uh, certain people and then a ton of apps behind it. Everything was in the folder. So that wasn't so good. So that's an extremely nice uh, feature that you can do. You also can see what you can kind of do some shortcuts in here as I right click and I did duplicate. You know, if it's mostly duplicates, then I could do that and then clean up. And uh, you also notice a lot of people don't take advantage of that. I can do that drag and drop. Remember, that's how I got the Active Directory users and computers in here. And this is another new feature that is kind of a little bit, and if this tree gets a little bit big, a, pane, a window pane that I actually can resize. You and uh, the administrator console, what I can do, but this was added. So I actually can resize that window as well. And then uh, the other one, this is a cool troubleshooting tool that I'm not sure everybody takes advantage of, but if I was to click on the application and go to the application tab, it has this verify targets and it comes back and it tells me, okay, this is running on one server, which I know and it's okay, as opposed to, oh, I forgot to install it on server two or server three. But I can do that at the folder level simply by right clicking on a folder and going to verify targets. And now it's gonna come back and it's gonna show me everything in there. And you can see that, um, hey, look at that. I don't have a couple of these tools installed on these other servers. Uh, that's gonna create some problems for me. I need to adjust and do that. The other thing that's very cool also is it gets kind of um, confusing who does what, but I, we have an effective access button down here. I can right click, I can put in a user here if I'd like. If I'm filtering by the client device name or the operating system or the IP address, any of those other filters that we can apply, I can go ahead and click view and it'll show me essentially what this person is seeing. Show only allowed public resources that'll kind of hide it. You can see things that they can't see plus things they can because it's grayed out, right? So I've actually, the first option is, oh, admin apps, right? Midwest is not a domain admin. I can show only public resources and now I can say, oh, this is what she sees. Yeah, there's nothing in there that'll get her into trouble. And yeah, these two are critical or something like that. So I can do the, uh, the effective access audit. The one other thing too in here, we, you know, the, um, if I was to right click, it's a shortcut to the settings audit. Or I can come here and go to that settings audit and this is where I can do a revert. So if I'd done something that I didn't want to do, I could highlight that item and didn't want to get rid of the productivity folder and I could come back here and just revert it, right? Um, and then there it's back. I could have done this as we looked at before by going down to the administration tab and then the settings on it and, and doing it that way. But in places that you can revert, and it's not everywhere in the console, the places that you can, you often can right click and just go to settings audit and, and find it that way. So that also is a very powerful uh, little shortcut that you guys can use. There's actually one other really cool uh, little feature and shortcut that I wanted to show you that um, I don't think a lot of people take advantage of either. This is for a more seamless experience for your end users. If I was to uh, right click on this, as we've been doing, you notice there's also a site default setting here. In the site default setting, it takes over the last few tabs in the application uh, properties, if I was to go into an application directly. But the display settings, the license settings, and then the shortcut settings. Right. The shortcut settings, now this piece here only works with the Parallels client directly. It doesn't work with HTML5 interface. It also doesn't work with, um, you know, the browser integrated HTML5. You have to use the client directly, but it can give your users a more um, 
a more seamless experience. I could just click this box here, create shortcut in the target folder. Here's the default, default folder for the start menu, but you can obviously change that as you want. Um, I also can put it in the auto start folder as well so that the application will launch when they log in in the morning. All right, or I can do the shortcut on the desktop. But effectively what that does is, again, you have to be running the, uh, the Parallels client and have it configured. It can't just be sitting there like, um, <clears throat> like it would be just unconfigured in the HTML5 client. But once I've done that, it goes ahead and creates the folder here. If I scroll down. Um, there it is, remote application, desktops, and applications, or remote desktop and applications. And here's all the all the applications right here in the start button. So that gives a very seamless uh, experience with that. If I want to modify that directly, it's like, well, I don't want to put everything in their start button or everything in the folder. That one is an app by app setting. I could come down here and just... Uh, see under domain uh, you know you don't need the active directory administrator center in your folder or whatever so i can come over here to shortcut shortcuts and say this one does not inherit the default settings and it does whatever here or if there's just one or two i want to put in the start menu so you can get kind of granular with that it's just that that site defaults obviously you can also access it right here we'll put them all in there and then here you can exclude a few that you don't want in there, or if you want to go the other way, I really don't want most of them in there, but there's a couple we'll put in. You could do it that way also. Uh, while I'm here, the display tab also is kind of an interesting uh, folder, or excuse me, interesting setting. And check the inherent defaults, we can see it. It uses the same nomenclature as the other ones. You know, if you've got applications that require specific color depth or resolution, you can do that here. It's usually best to just kind of let the, the application adapt to whatever the client is doing. But this setting right here can be very useful. Wait until all universal printers are redirected before showing the, uh, the application. It actually is can be a little bit of a delay. And, you know, so it's used for printers, that's what it says, but it also can be a, a bit of a delay when you check that because I, I Think of it this way. Suppose you're mapping drives to group policy, and I uh, and an application depends on I don't know the M drive to be there when it launches. What can sometimes happen is the application will launch, then group policy will run, and then it'll complete, and um, then the M drive gets mapped. Right. So the application launches faster than group policy can complete. And so the application launches, it completes, it looks at the M drive, there's no M drive, and then it fails or throws up errors or something like that. And you're like, well, that stinks. How do I resolve that? Introduce a little bit of a delay. Okay, let's let the application take a little bit longer before it opens, but when it does, the M drive or whatever else it's depending on will be there. So that's good. Um, also, don't forget that the client has the ability to do single sign-on. Right. If I go into tools and options, you can script all this too. The client can be scripted, by the way. If I go to single sign-on, I can turn it on and reboot. That way, when the user logs in, they're already logged into Parallels. And you can also set the app to start automatically. So then when they log in, they've either got shortcuts on their desktop, they've got um, shortcuts here inside the start menu, and they can just go to their applications and launch. It's pretty pretty seamless at that point, right? That's about as, as seamless as you're going to get to an end user remote application world. And I keep thinking of cool things. There's one other uh, little topic I want to show you, actually two others real quick. If I go back into the administrator console, I go down into policies. You can do this on the client directly, but it's always better to write to essentially control things in policies. I'll just go ahead and add a policy. By the way, this is another little feature that snuck in and I don't know is widely publicized, but if I change the object types about what a policy, a RAS policy will apply to, we've added computers. It used to just be kind of groups and users and the built-in security principles. We added computers. So now you can actually tie a policy to a workstation uh, as well as just users and groups. But where I was going with this is under connection in the advanced settings, there's some timeouts, right, that you can adjust, but to get that truly seamless experience, that's what made me think of it. You see that little RAS connection banner, the ribbon that, that flashes across the screen? 
And then ultimately, if the app takes a while, it's going to show the uh, it's going to show the desktop, right? The logging into Windows desktop, as you see. If you want to create a really seamless experience, you could hide both of those from the end user simply by jacking this up. You know, to something really high, like, I don't know, 360 seconds or something. What's that, six minutes? 300 is five minutes. You know, don't show that until five minutes. If the app hasn't launched in five minutes, you've got something else going on. And you could do that with a desktop, too. But you combine this with the shortcuts on the desktop and the single sign-on, it's going to feel pretty dang close to just a, uh, a local app as opposed to a remote app. And the one other one up here that kind of goes with that, um, this was new and was advertised quite a bit, but I always like to circle back to it, is this policy for session pre-launch. This only works with Windows clients, but it can be set one of two ways. The basic way is you, the administrator, are going to kind of set up a schedule. Okay, we're going to such and such days of the week, you know, it's going to do this and that and whatever. The better way, the cooler way, is really machine learning. And what this will do is um, as users log in, and it usually takes about two weeks to kind of get fully uh, fully uh, smarted up, I guess, in, in, in doing things, right, because it's machine learning. But it'll kind of figure out the user's habits, all of them, across the entire, uh, entire site here. And it will start launching the applications in advance. That's why it kind of needs a Windows clients because you got to have that tie-in. But it'll launch the window, the, whatever they're doing on the server side, it'll launch them in advance. Okay, everybody comes in Monday morning and they're a little late because it's Monday and they show up at 9 a.m. And they all hit the log on button at once. We get a login storm and that creates a lot of stress on our server. Okay, well, machine learning. Okay, we're going to have a large number of people coming in and they're launching this application, this application, and that application, usually right at 9 a.m. on the morning, and then about 8.30 or 8 the rest of the week. Let's get those running in advance, and so it'll kind of stagger that, and so the launches will, will happen before hours, right, so the applications are up and running, and so that A, avoids the, the logon storm, right, so you don't have to size your servers perhaps as, as beefy as you normally would. And the other benefit is for the end users, you know, they log in at nine and they launch their application. Well, they're connecting to a session that already exists. So they're just reconnecting. So it's very, very fast for the end users. So you add this, you add the hiding of the, the task bar the, with the splash window and, and the Windows desktop, perhaps if it's really slow, you put the shortcut on the desktop. Now you're getting pretty seamless, especially with that um, that single sign on. Yeah, so I think we covered that enough. Let's uh, let's move on. All right, so let me show you how delegate permissions works. So if I go into the RAS administrator console, remember again, the goal is that I want like um, a power user, or a senior person in this department to be able to manage sessions, but not affect other people, right? Maybe the accounting per, Department has a guy that's really good and he wants to help you out and he wants to manage the sessions like stuck so users that kind of stuff in the accounting department but you don't want him uh, doing anything that would affect sales or IT or anybody else and kicking them off this is accomplished through the use of themes okay so I go down to farm and I go into themes and I've got a bunch of different themes already allocated in here so uh, the way to do this is to first Let's limit the theme to just the department. So I'm going to take the reverse theme here. I'm going to have a group called silent. And I'm going to limit it to just the silent group. So I'll go ahead and click here and apply. So then if I to my browser and 
and I go to the reverse theme, only somebody that's a member of the, uh, the silent group can log in. So I'll log in with um, these are called Marilyn. She is not a member of the silent group, so she tries to log into this theme and she can't do it. She can log into another theme, perhaps, but not this one. However, I've got a Greta here. I'll have her log in, and she is a member of that group and can log in. So I'll have her go log in. Yeah, let's save her password, and then um, I'll go ahead and have her log in an application so we can get a session open. While that's going, I'm actually going to have Marilyn log in in a proper theme. So this is one that she does have access to. And I'll have her log in. And Marilyn likes to paint, so let's go ahead and get paint open for her. Okay, so Marilyn has paint open. I go back over to um, Greta's window, right, and she has Excel open here. So they're both on, and if I go back to the RAS console, farm already session host, and go to sessions, with reverse here, I, or refresh here, I can see that both Marilyn and Greta have a session open. All right, but they're in different departments, and I would like somebody to be able to manage that silent group that's not an IT person. So if I go to farm and themes, what I can do is just right click anywhere in the blank area and delegate permissions. So I'll go ahead and delegate permissions and then I want to pick somebody that's in that silent group. So I can come up here and go plus. I'll add an account. I'm going to add Charlie to be the uh, administrator or at least the kind of the help desk person for this group. So I'm going to add him in. And now he shows up in this accounts over here and I can determine what Charlie can and can't do. If I click anything up in the top section up here, you immediately say, oh, manage sessions. These are global permissions. Okay? They are going to mean that Charlie can now manage sessions across the entire site. I don't really want him to do that. I want to come down here to just reverse and have a manage sessions just on this one theme. So it's just the people that are logging into this theme, which should be just the silent department or the silent group. Go ahead and click OK. Yep, and it's telling me that the new positions, uh, you know, has to log out and log in, obviously, before this permissions take effect for Charlie. So I'll click OK and apply. OK, now that that's done, let's see what we can actually do with this. So let me minimize this and I'll go back to my web browser. Come in here and um, you can see Marilyn's logged in here and then here's Greta. I'm going to go to a new tab and I'm going to launch the web console. If you haven't seen this before, it's a relatively new feature, but it has been around for a while. So, um, it's a web interface. If you do a just the parallel server installation and you do a custom instead of taking the defaults next, 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 if you do a custom, the very last item on that list is the web or the web console. It doesn't get installed by default, so you need to do that. You can run the installer again on your current systems and do a change and add it if you want. But it just opens up a web console. You simply go to the server where it is and then type in this port 2443. It's in the documentation. And then it's a help desk tool. It's, it's limited in terms of what it can do, but it's that by design because it's meant to be more for help desk personnel and not for, um, not for an administrator per se. So I'll go ahead and have Charlie log into here. He should have permissions to it since we've added him. And you can see a couple of users, Greta and then Mae West. Mae West is in there because uh, she hadn't logged off and back on when I made all those theme changes. Normally you wouldn't see her, but she's grayed out. So we actually can't do anything with her anyway, but ultimately what she would disappear on him. But I can go up to actions for Greta and I can disconnect, log off. I can send her messages, things like that. So very nice help desk type. Um, Things. And if you have like different um, clients or tenants, you could even have somebody on site that kind of does this so they wouldn't have to bother you so much for basic stuff. All right, and with that, we're kind of concluded with the demo portion of this. There's just a few other topics that I want to cover, uh, mostly just some new features that were introduced I want to expose you to, but we're not going to really get to them in depth because mostly they're just, they're worth mentioning just so that you're uh, aware that they're there. 
The first one um, is our good partner, Scale Computing, a hyper-converged infrastructure platform. We've had integration with them for quite some time with VDI, just doing straight VDI auto scaling, right? Templates and creation of desktops and so forth. What we did in version 17.1 is we added uh, remote desktop session host auto scaling, so RESH or terminal server auto scaling. So it kind of completes and rounds out that solution and that integration, which is um, really kind of exciting. They're, like I said, they're one of our very good partners. Another one is we've extended the drag and, drag and drop functionality between the, uh, you know, the remote window and the workstation or the, uh, the client system. We've supported the ability to uh, drag from the client side to the server for quite some time. What we've done now is extended the ability to, or created the ability to do the reverse. So now you can drag not only from the client to the server, but also the server to the client. So you can go in both directions. And that, by the way, is supported on both the Windows and the Mac OS platforms. The other one is, is kind of an interesting one too, I guess. Uh, you know, RAS reporting is the only piece of remote application server that requires SQL. It's the only one that requires an external database. Uh, you know, we've we actually extended support finally to SQL Server 2017 and 2019. You know, the thing is, this is really kind of a testing statement. Uh, 2017 and 2019 have worked for quite some time. I've been using that in my lab environment for a while now. And then support on you if you pull them in and had an issue with it or running those versions of SQL. But we actually finally um, formalized and completed the, the reporting. So now that support is, is fully added in that. One other new one that's kind of interesting on the printing side is a, a feature called printer retention. If you go into the administrator console and go to universal printing, um, the category, you'll see a new selection option there called printer retention. What it does is it just makes the redirected printers become available faster, right? So instead of logging in and then, you know, you would log in and your apps would launch, but then um, your redirected printers may not be available right away if you just were going in to print something real quick. It may take a, a few minutes to show up. Uh, that setting, uh, it also can make the app launch faster. If you remember way back, we went into kind of the, uh, the application properties under publishing and then the display tab where you had that little delay and that checkbox that said don't launch the app until the printers are available in case you had an app that was dependent on that. Even if you had that box checked, this could make it uh, the application launch faster as well. Right, so what we're doing is instead of deleting the printers when the user logs off, they're kept in the registry. But we're just kind of removing or recalling the permissions and then when they log back on reinstating the permissions so it's more just like toggling a switch instead of having to make deletes and writes so it does speed things up a little bit uh, by the way uh, there's a great document on our website it's under our documentation for printing best practices we have a regular best practices document which has performance tuning and a whole bunch of other things that i cover generally in the basic training a little bit but there's also a, um, a printing best practices document on there that gets way down into some of the other settings that we recommend, you know, fonts and caching printers and things like that. So that's certainly worth uh, taking a look and a read. Uh, moving on, we've had a PowerShell interface for quite some time uh, that we've been using. You can actually deploy an entire RAS farm with it, manage it, do settings and all of that programmatically. We're constantly enhancing and extending that, and we've added a bunch of new commandlets that are now available uh, that it kind of enhances that functionality there. Um, there's an online guide for that also under that uh, resources area where you can go and find uh, the rest of our documentation. But the other cool thing that we've done is we've opened up an API. So we've implemented the REST API, and you can now um, control them by writing another program or having some other utility integrate in with Parallels Remote Application Server through the API. So that's there as well. Again, both of those, the information about them is available on our website under that resources area. You know, you go to parallels.com, you click on support, you click on Remote Application Server, and you scroll all the way down to the bottom to the technical documentation and resources. That's where it is. Or you can just go to this link right here. And that will uh, provide you all the information that you need to uh, get started and rolling with that. Okay, and with that, uh, we're kind of done. Just a quick little wrap up here and a few things. You know, there is going to be a follow up email that's going to come out to everybody. 
It will have a link to this recording, so you will be able to listen to this and listen to me over and over again, right? I'm sure everybody wants to do that. Um, it also has the slide deck that I use. That also will be available and in there, okay? And uh, it also will have a link to a survey. And I do ask that you fill out the survey, please, and fill it out honestly. Uh, you know, a lot of places they're like, oh, anything less than a perfect is a failure. You're not going to get me into trouble. You're not going to hurt my feelings. But please uh, fill out the survey and fill out it honestly, because we actually use that to, um, to kind of adjust our training a little bit. So if there's something that you want to spend a little bit more time in, or uh, we didn't cover that maybe we should add, or, you know, skip over that, whatever, uh, just please fill it out. When you do that, make sure that you talk about the advanced training and then also specify your geography. We do have different people to train around the world. And if you don't fill out the geography where you're from, um, then I won't know, uh, won't know if you're talking about me or somebody else or, or what. So please do that. And then, of course, the other piece um, is, you know, there is the certification exam. So please uh, go ahead and do that. And I had this slide up earlier, but just so we can see it again. If you log into the partner portal, you can get trained, get started, um, or get certified, I guess, under the Parallels Remote Application Server training link there. That provides a lot of the online documentation and training, or excuse me, the online training stuff that's available to our partners. And then if you scroll down to the bottom, there's a place where you can go ahead and take that exam and you can get your little badge to be Parallels Technical Certified, and there'll be a new one for uh, advanced training. Okay, and with that, we are done and finished. So thank you, thank you so much for attending. Um, I'm gonna hang around for a few minutes just so we can answer any questions that you might have. But other than that, we're there, but, and I'm also gonna go back to the chat window and the Q&A section and see if there's any uh, questions that I missed, and we'll go through that. But, but from a formal standpoint, we're done. So unless you just wanna hang out and uh, Hear the questions, which is kind of always good. Uh, thank you again so much and have a great day.
Okay, I haven't seen any other questions in a few minutes, so I think that'll do it. I'm going to go ahead and uh, end the WebEx. Thanks again, everybody, for showing up. I'm going to go ahead and end the WebEx. Have a great day. Thanks for attending.